Well, I believe that there are few more relevant, important topics than homosexuality. And yet, un unfortunately, Christians sometimes feel immobilized or ill-equipped on how to engage on this topic. We have friends who don't know Christ, and sometimes we're at a loss for words. And so we say little or nothing. While others may be saying things on the media, you know, on, on television, and s comes across as being very negative, and then we get thrown into that lump. So generally speaking, Christians have a very bad reputation at how we engage on this issue of sexuality. There's a book that's called Unchristian, written by David Kinnaman and Gabe Lyons. It was published in 2007, and they wanted to know how young Americans view Christians. They asked a whole bunch of questions, some positive, some negative, and by far, Christians are viewed by young Americans, age 16 to 29, in a very negative way. We are viewed from the bottom to be confusing, not accepting, or boring, and sensitive, out of touch, too political, old-fashioned, hypocrit hypocritical, judgmental, and guess what's at the very, very top? Anti-homosexual. I mean, looking at that list, why would anyone, anyone want to be a Christian? And if you notice, look at those percentages, 91% of those not raised in the church believe that we are anti-homosexual. I mean, that's a huge percentage. This survey was done in 2007. I bet that survey is even higher today. But what about our youth and young adults? We teach them, love the sinner, hate the sin. But according to this survey, 8 out of 10 of our own young adults and youth believe that we are anti-homosexual. No, it doesn't say anti-homosexuality. Kind of more the issue, more the topic, or, you know, generally speaking. But that's not even what this survey asked. This survey asked, and, and it showed that Christians, we are viewed to be against gay people. And that is wrong. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not against people. It's for people turning from their sins and turning to the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's still for people. But unfortunately, people's perception is their reality. So what can we do as Christians to do a better job? I mean, I think we have to admit the perception that we have is very negative. The approach, generally speaking, that we've taken has not been very effective. So what can we do to improve? So I'm going to give some things here uh, that, that's going to be a bit uh, of a suggestion. If you would like my notes, there's a QR code that you can, you can scan this QR code to get my notes. It's, it's free. Um, you'll, you'll be asked to sign up for an account with Dropbox. If you don't have one already, you can just say, no, thank you. If you don't want to, or, you, know, you don't have to sign up for an account. But it's my notes free. If you don't know what a QR code is, that's okay. <laughs> you can just... Jot down the shortened URL for uh, those of you that are less tech savvy. Uh, but there's, there's many ways that we could have a Christian response to homosexuality. We could look at what's going on in our courts, in our legal system. We can look at what's going on with the laws be that being passed through government. We could kind of tie into this culture war that is raging, or we could look at this kind of more from a sociological perspective or a developmental psychological foundation, or we could first start where I think as Christians we always must start, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we are sinners in need of a Savior. Jesus Christ came to die for all and give us new life and put your faith in him. I mean, that is no, nothing is more foundational than the gospel. So how then do we, using the gospel as our foundation, build from that a true Christian response, not to homosexuality, but more importantly, to our loved ones and friends in the gay community, to our loved ones and friends who experience same-sex attractions? So I'm going to give you guys uh, some of my uh, you know, suggestions here. And honestly, 
several of these will be uh, a critique. If we need to improve, that means there needs to be some correction. So hopefully you guys are confident enough to maybe break some paradigms, uh, you know, let go of some things that we think are, are you know, some, some strongholds or whatever it is, and just open up our hands and just hear what God has for us in regards to this. So first and foremost, we need to make sure we have the right attitude. Before we do anything, we need to make sure we're approaching this with the right posture. And that has to begin with being convicted about our own sins. I think that's a great place to start. Conviction about our own sins, because generally speaking, from, from what I've heard sin, 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 from the past you know, several decades, is when we approach this, especially Christians, we have this reputation, reputation that we're busy at pointing out other people's sins. When I lived as a gay man years ago, I felt Christians were telling me that gays and lesbians deserved a hotter place in hell. That Jesus had to hang on the cross a little bit longer for gays and lesbians. But we know that that's not true. Yes, same-sex relationships are sinful, but it is not the worst sin. And yet we often treat it like that, especially from, from what, you know, the, the people that are supposed to be spokespersons for the church, for the evangelical church, that you always hear on television, you know, which we're like, why do they always go to him to get the, you know, it's like, that's the worst person. I would never go to that person. That doesn't, doesn't represent us. You know what I'm talking about. But unfortunately, we can't help it. Media go to those people because that's what's going to sell. And that's, you know, if, if they got someone who's, who actually is more reasonable and, and has a more, you know, a, a truly gospel-centered answer, no one's going to watch that. So they get the, these people that just say these statements that are really inflammatory and that, you know, it's, it's going to attract hits on, on YouTube or whatever. And, and, and the rest of us Christians are like, that person is crazy. I don't know about you. I say that, okay? <laughs> you know, that person does not represent me, and yet all of a sudden, those words get lumped on me. So, you know, we, pe people like that will give this bad impression that you know, gays and lesbians are going to hell. And, and, and I know that, generally speaking, people will, especially conservative Christians who holds a biblical sexuality, they'll look at the Bible and say, well, the Bible says that it's an abomination. So what's wrong with saying that's an abomination? Well, if you do that, fine. I mean, you are saying what the Bible says, but let's not be, you know, biased in that I read the whole Bible. And when I read the whole Bible, I come to Proverbs chapter 6 that says that pride is an abomination. Causing dissension is an abomination. So when was the last time your friend was a bit prideful and you say, you are abomination? <laughs> maybe we should. And when we do that, <laughs> really, I mean, maybe we should. Because when we do that, we wouldn't be elevating one sin worse than the other. Because the Bible, I mean, sees that all sin is you know, heinous in his eyes. And we wouldn't trivialize sin that we often do as Christians. Do trivialize it. And, and, I even hear some Christians that will say, well, I can't help it. When I see a gay couple together or when, you know, you turn on the television and you see a lesbian couple kissing, whatever, and that, that makes me feel uncomfortable. You know, more my, my, my sister who's lesbian, they come over and they, they hold hands. You know, I, that just grosses me out. And I'm not at all trying to diminish the severity of any sin, but I feel that we need to not confuse morality with what makes us feel comfortable or not. Because I think that that feeling that some of us might have toward this one sin or even any other sin should really be a reminder for us that that feeling you might have is just a fraction of what God feels when he looks at your own sin and maybe even more because we know better. Because it's one thing to be disgusted about our own sin and something totally different to be disgusted about someone else's sin. I mean, just think about that for a moment. How easy it is to look at someone else and say, oh, I can't believe what she's doing. I would never do that. We say that in our minds. And I don't think that that is necessarily from God. I think what we should say is, I can't believe the sin that I'm still doing. And be just as disgusted about our own own sin. Because let me tell you what happens when we do that. That humbles us greatly. Because at the end of the day, 
I want to lead people to Christ. Amen? But let's think about that for a moment. Have you ever met anyone who came to Christ through being prideful? Uh, you know, looking at someone else down their nose and think, I'm better than you, and, you know, I pity, pity you that you're a sinner. You know, I've yet to meet anyone who came to Christ. They're a holier-than-thou attitude. You know what I mean? I mean, oh, I came to Jesus. This lady, she was so pompous, right? I mean, have you ever met? I mean, I've never heard that. You know, of all the testimonies that I've heard, I've never heard that. It's usually someone who's loving and compassionate and puts up with all their junk and didn't just continuously point out their sin, but was probably real about their own sin. My good friend, Dr. Rosaria Butterfield, also come from a past. She was a, a former lesbian, queer theory, feminist, English professor at Syracuse, tenured. She began reading the Bible as part of her research of the religious right, which is dangerous to do when you want to read the Bible, especially as an English professor. And she read it, and God radically transformed her. But, you know, it wasn't just the Bible that radically transformed her. She developed this friendship with this older pastor. And she tells in her testimony, he didn't preach at her. He didn't, you know, uh, and every time they would, him and his wife would have her over in their home, he didn't point out their sin, her sin. We said, well, then, how, you know, they, he's not doing his job. He was doing his job and living the gospel. And, and so we, you know, we need to realize that, that it, is, it is first recognizing our own sin first. Because really, when we grasp the extent of the fall, Genesis 3, Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, how that has tentacles into every one of our, 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 our lives, who we are, we'll realize that I'm no different than any of you, or I'm no different. From, I mean, as a matter of fact, I'm no different than the mass murderer. I'm no different than that person in Las Vegas. He's a sinner, I'm a sinner, but by the grace of God go I. And, and, and when we have that, there's a democratization that happens when we realize our own sin nature. So first, um, you know, this is, you know, this is not the worst sin, and our sin is just as odious in God's eyes that leads to humility. Second, we need to be consistent. And this is consistent in three ways. First of all, we need to be consistent regarding relationships. What is your marriage, what is your marriage status? Are you, or, or what is your relationship status? Are you married or are you single? And that's such a core part of how we describe who we are. You know, when you're in a new group of people, and you go around the circle, and, and they ask, well, tell us, a little about, tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, it's where you're from, you know, maybe how old you are, and then your relationship status. Are you married or single? Well, usually, if you are married, you'll talk about that. If you're single, you don't say that. You just, you know, go on and talk about other things. Uh, but, I mean, you go on and say, I'm married, you know, I have so-and-so, how many kids, and, you know, you maybe talk about your job, etc. And that is you know, where we see that people who aren't married, they're almost less than. We have, we have elevated marriage to be better than singleness. And you might think, I, I see that, but how does this relate to my gay friend, my gay neighbor, my gay son, or my gay, you know, relative? A lot. Because as we hold to biblical sexuality, our message to them is you need to walk away from same-sex relationships. And if so, do we have, a, a, you know, what does that exactly mean for them today? Be single for a period in your life, if not the rest of your life. And if so, do we have a healthy place for singles to thrive in Christian community today? Not so much. Singles feel like second-class citizens. Oftentimes, my gay friends tell me what you're saying is, you want me to be lonely for the rest of my life. And what they're doing is they're equating singleness with loneliness. But it's not the same thing. Because let me tell you, I know some people who are married, and they're still miserably lonely. <laughs> so marriage is not the cure to loneliness. I don't know how, why we have bought into the lie that marriage will bring you contentment, ultimate contentment. Yes, it can bring you joy, just as relationships in general can bring you joy. And it can bring you a lot of joy. But it should not be the, the means by which you get all your contentment. 
I almost see that we have at times been at risk of idolizing marriage. And, and people really get, get defensive when I say that. How can, I, how can you say that you're idolizing marriage? Marriage is good. Yes, it's good. But let me tell you the most deceptive form of idolatry is when we worship something good. Good things aren't meant to be worshipped. Only God is meant to be worshipped. I mean, think back when you were kids and your teacher would read you fairy tales. Remember that? How do all fairy tales end? Well, first... They get married, and then they live happily ever after. I mean, look at all the stories. I mean, that's how it is. They get married, then they live happily ever after. The end. You know, they get married, the end. No, you know, no 10-year checkup or 20-year checkup. I mean, hopefully, you know, imagine the fairy tales went out like that. You know, like they, you know, hopefully they're still living happily ever after. But let me tell you the real lesson we should be teaching our children. It is not marriage that should bring you ultimate contentment. It is Jesus Christ who should bring you ultimate contentment, whether you're married or whether you're single. That's the message that we should be telling our kids, our youth, everyone. I mean, it is really ingrained in our Christian culture. I teach at Moody Bridal Institute. You know, right? I mean, it's, it is so hugely... I, I went to Moody, and I loved my time at Moody, by the way, uh, but there was a sense of culture shock when I started because I went to college, you know, uh, regular college, you know, unleaded college, uh, you know, it was secular school. It was a regular Big Ten school, University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana. And, I mean, it's a big, big Ten, you know, it's a, it's a huge school. I mean, the, probably the size of, you know, the school was probably bigger than here. I don't know. I mean, it's just tons of tons of people. And I, I was just a regular kid. I wasn't Christian. I uh, did all, everything else that, that they did. And I then went to Moody, and I was like, this is different, in, a, in good ways. But when it comes to dating, it was just so strange because, I mean, in a sense, there was a good part where the kids didn't want to do the way that the world did things in regards to relationships and dating, et cetera. That's fantastic. I also agree with that. But then there was this, you know how sometimes we're like, we just swing the pendulum on like just one, you know, the way like the opposite direction of like middle is good, but then we're like, whoo, you know, we go all the way to the other end. So, you know, to the point where these freshman kids were coming in and, you know, they're like, I'm not going to date, I'm going to court, okay? I'm, I'm not going to just, you know, it's just either this person is, I, I, is someone that I could really marry or not. If not, then I'm just not going to consider that, which is also good. But then to the point where these kids, I mean, remember, they're just kids, 18, 19, 20 years old, and they would date on the first date, and they'll, uh, you know, they'll go through the checklist, you know, okay, you know, is this, uh, you know, what are you doing for ministry, what do you, you know, and then, and then, you know, how many kids do you have, you know, and then, you know, you know how, where do you want to live, and it's like, slow down, you know, <laughs> you know, we, and, and we have to have this sense, it has to be balanced. I, I, I'm not saying that we, we don't take seriously getting to know each other. But then when we are going in overdrive, that, I think, is kind of an over-response, especially on the first date. You know, get to know the person first. You know, I mean, you know, get to know their name or, you know, I mean, just at least, you know. Then even out, I always tell youth, you know, young adults and my Moody students, you know, I don't know if dating is the best context in which to get to know another person. You know, I mean, think back when you, when you were younger. And, uh, you know, my, my students... When they go out on these dates, what do they do? They put on their best attire. You know, the, the ladies spend that half an hour or an hour or two to get ready. You know, put on their best, right? I mean, which is good. There's nothing bad wrong with that. Guys, you know, they'll take a shower or, you know, whatever. Good, good <laughs> things to do. But we're, we're putting our best me forward, right? But when we put our best me forward, that might even be a distortion of who me is. You know what I mean? That isn't then really getting to know that person for real. So, I mean, I'm just putting that question out there. We need to, we need to still take seriously. We're not going to do it the way the world does, but is what we're doing almost, and almost in, a, in a sense, elevating this as, well, that's what I have to do. There's this pressure in our context, but it's not just in the Christian world. It's also in the secular world. And it came to the forefront in 2015, on June 26th, when the Supreme Court made that, made that watershed decision that legalized same-sex marriage in all 50 states, uh, if you read the majority, the majority opinion written by Supreme Court Justice Kennedy, 
you go through, and I mean, I think I, I don't agree with a lot with what he said because of the logic that he had to, 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 to reason why he supported this. But to me, what really put, you know, that just really revealed where he was off is at the very end, the last paragraph, where he said, marriage is the highest ideal of love. Say that again. Marriage is the highest ideal of love. And he claims to know God. He is wrong. Marriage is not the highest ideal of love. It's a form of love. It's an expression of love. But it is not the highest ideal of love. God is. God alone is love. Think about, I mean, of all the world religions we have, I mean, from around the world, from now even ancient religions all the way back, look at every religion that existed. They can claim their God is loving. Our God is love. No other religion, no other world, I mean, uh, can claim that, that their God, love is an ontological reality of their God. It's not that our God is loving, he is, but he is love. That's a, that's a huge difference. And when anyone tries to say something different, that no, this is the highest ideal of love, I'm going to very firmly but respectfully agree. Marriage is not the highest ideal of love. I mean, so when I read that, I just was, I couldn't contain myself. And, I, and I, me and my good friend, Dr. Rosario Butterfield, that I mentioned, we wrote a response, and it was you know, published in several outlets uh, but we, we have it published out there, and we, we titled it Something Greater Than Love. You know, we heard all these people that were responding, on, 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 and, and we kind of could see on, on one side people celebrating marriage equality, and then on the other side, you know, strong evangelical Christians that were grieving what was happening, but th- what they were doing. They were then con- continuing to hold up this traditional marriage thing. And what I saw through, through all of that was both sides were overemphasizing marriage. It's good, but it is not the best. There's a big difference. We have to continue to lift up the beauty and gift of marriage. It's good. But let me tell you what I think we've done. We've done that at the expense of singleness. So singleness at best is a consolation prize. I'm so sorry you're single. Many of you guys might have friends who are Christian, and heaven forbid they're They're single in their 30, 40, 50s. And I bet oftentimes when we think about them, we feel sorry for them. Singles don't need our pity. Singles need to be loved. Singles need to be known that they are part of the family of God. Let's stop pitying the singles around us. Yes, it's not easy being single. I'm 47 years old, and I am single. It's not easy. But we can't give this impression then that not being single is either easy either, right? I mean, I'm not married, but from what I hear, marriage, you know, has sometimes where it's difficult, <laughs> right? I mean, I, I, I can't say it firsthand, but it's not just a simple walk in the, you know, in the park, there's some challenges, but then why? But then there's blessings with marriage, right? There's challenges, there's blessings. But then also, let's look at the single life. There are challenges. I can be witness to that. And those of you that, have, you know, every one of us have been single at some point. Not every one of us are necessarily married. Most will be married. But everyone at some point has been single. And we can all see that there's singleness has, has some challenges. But if, if you can just look carefully, I bet you there were some blessings that you can say. But then why is it then that we only focus upon the enormous blessings of marriage and the enormous challenge of singleness? This is clearly inconsistent. I have a friend who lives as a, is a single, uh, who, who was a missionary and went into the mission field to China, single, was there in China for five years, came back to the U.S. on furlough, uh, as a single woman, and when she was back in the U.S. on furlough, she, you know, just had the opportunity to just kind of reconnect with many friends that she just hadn't seen for a long time, spent a lot of time with uh, in China. She just kind of had, had some, she had to just cut off connections and, and communication for a little while. So when she was back here in the U.S. on furlough, and when she would hang out with those friends, 
it would all be kind of the, the similar, similar thing. They would ask her about ministry, about her time in China, and about future plans, and they would kind of go to the more personal things like, are you dating anyone? Do you have anyone special in your life? And every time she would say, without you know, any issue, she would say, no, I don't. I mean, it wasn't a big deal for her. Do you know how some of her friends responded? Can I pray for you? It was as if she had cancer. Singleness is not cancer. It's not a curse. But don't we treat it like it is, like the unbearable burden? And, you know, we, we have to look at what the Word of God says. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul spends an entire chapter talking about marriage and singleness. I, I believe it is one of the most important chapters when it comes to marriage and singleness and probably one of the hardest chapters to discern what exactly is going, going on in this, in this chapter. And yet, we can at least say that Paul is saying that marriage is good and singleness is good. He, Paul even goes on to say that singleness is a gift. But let me give you a little bit of advice for those of you in this room who are not single and you're married. Don't keep reminding your single friends that this is a gift. Because the most, most Christian singles that I know don't like that verse. I mean, they're like, I don't care. That's not like their life verse. I love it when Paul says that it's a gift. Hallelujah. No, they don't say that. They just, you know, they don't. <laughs> you know, they, they, it, they might think, I don't care what Paul is saying that it's a gift. What's the return policy on that gift? <laughs> you know, you still got that receipt. I want to give it back. You know, like a bad Christmas present. I don't want it. It's not easy being single. Most, and most of my uh, Christian friends are, uh, you know, we can all say that Marriage is a gift, hallelujah, marriage is a gift. But when it comes to singleness, most Christians that I know do not wholeheartedly agree that it's a gift. Instead, you know what they say? It's a calling. <laughs> Seriously, not anyone can be single. I mean, it's like you got to, I even hear people, they're like, you need to make sure, you know, people who have this, you know, they, they get this supernatural, unique, unusual revelation from God that they're going to be single. Like, I mean, it's just so outside the realm of possibility for someone to actually have this. You know, it's a calling. I mean, it's so, it's so hard. It's, you, know, you, you know, you get this supernatural strength to, just to be single. You know, it's, you know, like, you know, you have to be the Superman or Wonder Woman to be single, which I don't know if you've noticed, but most superheroes are single. Right? I mean, I mean, their weakness is their love interest. So if they're going to continue to be superheroes, they got to, like, forsake, you know, their love interest to be a superhero, to be single. I don't think that's the best message for us to give. And, you know, the majority of my Christian friends are married, and they're happily married. But they tell me that marriage takes work. Giving of yourselves, loving unconditionally, that's not easy. Paul even goes on to say in Ephesians 5, husbands... Lay your life down for your wives. Amen, ladies? Amen? So I don't know what husband that doesn't struggle with, that impossible calling. So do you know what I say, tongue-in-cheek? I say marriage, whew, that's a calling, seriously. <laughs> you know, right? Think about it. Singleness, that's a gift. I don't have to lay my life down for anyone yet. But I'm not saying that. I don't think singleness is better than marriage because that would not be biblical. I don't also believe that marriage is better than singleness. I'm just simply looking at the full counsel of God from the Old Testament all the way to the New Testament, particularly how Jesus and, the, and Paul articulated this in the New Testament, and realize that godly marriage and godly singleness are two sides of the same coin. We should no longer only emphasize one against the other. We have elevated marriage to be almost sometimes where we even think that singles, if you're still single, then you're somehow immature. Not to say, I mean, yes, people are immature and that are single, but I don't think all singles are immature. Are you following me? I mean, it's just like saying, you know, a white horse is a horse, but not everything that's white is a horse. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it just doesn't logically flow. Yes, there are some people immature, but I know some people who are married that are immature as well. You know, I mean, there's sometimes people that like pastors that like they're they're pushing these Christian men to get married. And it's like, how do you know that everyone is called to be married? Sometimes maybe I mean, I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing to marry later. 
That, that doesn't mean that it's bad to marry early. I think we just need to follow God's will, period. Follow God's will. Don't be forced into anything. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's marriage is, is good, and singleness is a good, is good. I also think that we misunderstand when Paul talks about this as a gift. He says, you know, I wish as all as everyone was as I was, and you know, some people have, have one gift and other people have another gift, and this is talking about you know the gift of singleness. What does that mean? And what I often hear hear that people respond to that is say, well, I don't have the gift of singleness, and then I say, why? And they say, well, I didn't. I don't want to be single. I mean, that's not something that I enjoy. And I've heard, I mean, I've, I've been reading a lot. I, I'm writing my book now on the theology of sexuality, and one of the chapters is on singleness. And I've read a lot, you know, people are trying to explain this theology of singleness, and they say, well, you know, it's something that you enjoy being single. And, and that, you know, you don't have a desire to get married. And a gift is, can't, especially from God, can't be distilled to a feeling. It's, it's, it's not just like enjoyment is, is a gift from God. And they say, well, I don't really enjoy being single, so therefore I don't have the gift of singles. Or they'll even say, well, I didn't choose to be single, so therefore I don't have this gift of singleness. Which, you know, when people say, you know, there's choice, they, they didn't choose it, well, but you still are single. And yes, you didn't choose that, but honestly, no one chose, uh, no one chose to be single. You know, I mean, have you ever met anyone who was born married? Right? I mean, it's just, we just are. It is default. So we misunderstand what Paul is talking about when, when he says it's a gift. Because we think about gifts like, like the way that kind of Americans think about gifts. I mean, uh, just the concept of gifts and gift giving and presents is just a, a modern Western concept in my mind. Especially, um, yes, they, they give gifts back then. But the, the extent to where we have it today, it's so me-centered, right? Isn't that, that our kind of our American culture, it's, everything's me-centered, so I give you a gift, and, you know, I want you to the individual to like that gift. If you don't like it, well, then you do whatever you want with it. You can get rid of it, you can exchange it, and get something else that you like. So it, you see how it's what you like and, and what brings you enjoyment, that's what's so, so focused upon the purpose of this gift. Well, that word for gift or present, the generic word for that in the Greek is the Greek word doron, but he doesn't use that. Paul doesn't use that word in 1 Corinthians 7. Instead, he uses a different word, and it's the Greek word charisma, which means and has been translated in other passages in the New Testament, most of the passages in the New Testament, as spiritual gift. It's a grace gift. Charisma is from the Greek word charis, which means grace. It's a grace gift. It's something from God. It's a spiritual gift. So what does that mean? I mean, how does that help us better understand this? Well, first of all, spiritual gifts aren't chosen by the individual. Yeah, you know, think about this. I mean, do Paul list all, you know, spiritual gifts in, you know, elsewhere in the New Testament are spiritual gifts ever chosen by the individual? Never. They're given from God. I mean, that's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7. They're from God. Okay, so they're not chosen by me. But what if I don't like a certain spiritual gift? Then does that mean that I don't have it? Let's take the gift of prophecy. Did all the Old Testament prophets all want their gift? Like every one of them. Did they, is that the, you know, I loved it. I mean, ask Jonah. Right? I mean, go down the list, you know, Ezekiel, even Isaiah, I mean, Moses, you know, he's like, take my brother. He didn't want it, you know. I can't even speak, Moses, you know, so take my, bro my brother. Uh, I mean, uh, Moses, right? I mean, he was, he was lamenting. I, 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 I look at the, and I wonder if, wonder if, if they actually had a diagnosis back then for depression, I think most of them would be, you know, diagnosed as having chronic depression. They didn't enjoy their spiritual gift. That's not the purpose of a spiritual gift. What is the purpose of a spiritual gift? Well, going on and reading what Paul talks about spiritual gifts in Ephesians 4 and in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul says that the purpose of a spiritual gift is not for me. It's not to make me happy. Hopefully it does, but that's not his purpose. Paul tells us the purpose of a spiritual gift, a charisma, is for the building up of the body of Christ. Why is there the gift of teaching? Or 
the church? Why is there the gift of administration for the church? And why, my friends, is there the spiritual gift of singleness for the church? And for those of you in this room that happen to be unmarried and are single, we need you. We cannot be the body of Christ with members missing. We need every member to be a part of the body, doing their part in edifying and building up the body of Christ. We need you. No matter what you feel, we still need you. And for those of you in this room that happen to not be single and are married, I think many of us may have to repent. Repent that we haven't made our single sisters and brothers feel like they really belong. We've ha- we haven't helped them celebrate their spiritual gift and almost squashed it to the detriment of the body of Christ. I don't even know if we're ready to address the issue of sexuality until we first redeem biblical singleness. We need to be convicted regarding uh, relationships. Second, we need to be consistent regarding sexuality. What does sexuality look like in regards, you know, when it comes to God? What's his standard? I mean, we have for the longest time lifted up heterosexuality as God's goal, as God's standard. And I even hear people say, well, you know, my my goal for someone who has same-sex attractions is to help them pursue a heterosexual potential. I'm like, well, what does that mean? Well, you know, to have heterosexual feelings. Well, Okay, if I help someone have heterosexual feelings or pursue heterosexuality, then I could, I mean, that's such a broad term. Heterosexuality means being attracted to some of the opposite sex or being sexually intimate with some of the opposite sex. So, in other words, I could be a, a man and I'm sleeping around with half a dozen or a dozen different women. That's considered heterosexuality, Right? I could be a married man, and I'm cheating on my wife with another woman. That's also considered heterosexuality. I could be a unmarried man, but I'm in a monogamous relationship with my girlfriend. We're even living together. We even had a few children together. We've never been with anyone else. We're committed to one another. We plan to someday to get married, and we love each other. Those three scenarios that I gave you are heterosexual, but they're sinful in God's eyes. God would never use a standard that had sin in it. So it can't be heterosexuality. That's too broad. I know people think, well, marriage is in that category of heterosexuality. True. Marriage is there, but everything outside of marriage still under the broad category of heterosexuality is sin. So it's not homosexuality either. Then what is God's standard? It's holy sexuality. When I read through the full counsel of God, there's only two paths for us to be on. Through, I mean, through all of Scripture, two paths that God allows us or God calls us to. First, if you're single, then be faithful to God by being sexually abstinent. If you're not single and you're married, then be faithful to God by being faithful to your spouse of the opposite sex. Faithful physically, faithful sexually, emotionally, relationally, all of these things. Be completely faithful to your spouse of the opposite sex. So, holy sexuality, two paths. Either chastity and singleness, faithfulness in marriage. And we all start here. Many of us will move over to this path when you get married. But being realistic, most of you guys that are married, and and hopefully it'll be many, many years, but after a time, you know, when you get older, Usually, one goes home to be the Lord before the other one. And when that happens, that's not by choice, right? But then when that happens, the one that remains here on earth is widowed and and single, not by choice. But when that happens, then they're to be single and sexually abstinent. What I like, I mean, these two two paths that we're on, that we're called to be on, there's no term to be inclusive of those. So I had to create a term, and I call it not heterosexuality, not homosexuality, but holy sexuality. As a matter of fact, this whole framework of, of heterosexuality, homosexuality, or in these things are, sec- are secular. They, they don't apply to when it comes to Christian living. 
I think it actually confuses us more than anything else. I think we just need to do, do away with, with this when it comes to Christian living. I mean, yes, we use those, use those terms when we interact with interact when it comes to Christian living. But when, but when it comes to how we live, it comes to how applies Christian living, it applies to taking a round peg, round peg and trying to jam it, jam it into square peg. A new framework. A new framework. We need God's framework, framework and its holiness. What I like about this is this applies to everyone in this room, everyone that you know, whether you're man or woman, whether if you have heterosexual feelings, homosexual, you know, feelings don't change God's standards. You know what I mean? Human feelings don't change. It's God's standards, and then we apply, you know, our lives to those standards. We don't change them just because I feel one way or another. There's no, like, one category of living for these type of people. Okay, all of us, all of us, everyone must need, need to pursue sexuality, pursue sexuality, chastity, chastity, and list, list in marriage. And I know, you know you think, well, that's fine, well, that's fine, there's half, but people who are attracted to Oregon, and I know you only have a path to be lived up, to live, to live up for the not necessarily, not necessarily so. A friend who lived as a who lived as a gay man for many years comes to Christ. Christ, he still didn't have, still didn't have any interest in girls, girls, and he was going to be single, single for the rest of his life, and he was okay with that. Well, while he, you know, you know, was just growing and growing, and I see had a, he had a group of people that were like his, well, his, his family, people, that were, and they held him accountable and that just helped him grow, grow as a Christian, godly man. He became really close friends with this young lady. She had nothing to do with homosexuality, but she was a fairly new Christian, and before she became uh, a, a Christian, she was like most other non-Christian girls. I'm dated, and, and she was sexually active. She actually had a couple abortions. Unfortunately, some of those boyfriends that she had, those relationships, were a bit toxic. So when she came to Christ, she kind of made a commitment with God. He said, I'm just going to hold off on dating because she really wanted to focus on a relationship with God. So the two of them felt really safe together. There wasn't that weirdness that happens, you know, between a guy and a girl, and that when they're both single, it looks like, does he like me? Does she like me? Because she knew he didn't like girls, and he knew that she didn't really want to date. So they became like best buddies. After some time of being best friends, he began noticing some things about her that he never noticed before. Her hair. She smelled good, and she had curves. <laughs> She says, puberty is hard going through once, right? Going through puberty twice. He got up enough courage, asked her out on a date, and after some dating, he asked her to marry him. And after some, uh, and, 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 you know, uh, you know he, she said yes, and they, they married. And on their wedding night, he told his new bride, he said, honey, I can't explain this. I'm not attracted to any other women. I'm only attracted to you. That is holy sexuality. Not heterosexuality is God's goal. Not homosexuality is God's goal. It's holiness, chastity and singleness, faithfulness in marriage. Third, we need to be consistent regarding change. What in the world does that look like? I think we need to kind of let go of this paradigm that we think that somehow if, if a person still has attractions in that realm, then they haven't been healed or delivered or, or whatever term you want to use for that. Because do we apply that principle, that standard for anything else? Like, I had a friend, if I had a friend who was a drunk, comes to Christ, stops drinking, but after years of sobriety, he admits that he still has urges to drink, but he doesn't. Would we tell him, you haven't been changed? We need, to, we need to lay some hands on you. You need some deliverance. I really hope not. Because let me tell you, I think the manifestation of God's grace is more evident in his life because he, on a daily basis, says no to his flesh and says yes to God. So change, it is not the absence of temptations. God never promises you that you will not be tempted with sin. Jesus Christ himself was tempted. What makes us think we won't be? So change is not the absence of temptations. Change is the ability, the freedom to, uh, to say yes to holiness, to choose holiness, even in the midst of temptations. Convicted, consistent in three ways regarding, regarding relationships, sexuality, and change. And then third, we need to be compassionate. I've been teaching at Moody for over uh, nine years. I can't believe it. They they're still you know, keep inviting me back. Then every year, I get students that confide with me. I have same-sex attractions. I think I'm gay. Oftentimes, they tell me I've never told anyone. And because of that isolation, they tell me I've suffered with depression and even thoughts of suicide. That should love us. 
that we have we have uh, to or for whatever reason to share this share this with the rest of us. So for rest of us. So for some, this isn't to be too like that. What what can we do to be a, a place where we are not are not afraid to open up up with each other ab about what's what they're wrestling with with what's the world topic about spaces what's the topics. I, I wonder, shouldn't the safest, the safest space in the world be the, be the body of Jesus? And the question is, are you safe? safe? But let me tell you, I don't think we should just say, because that's just, that's just where safe just means I can just, just say whatever I want, want and uh, we have that, have that kind of, of, sa of safety transparency. That, have that's really the church. I mean, yes, we need to be safe, but we need to go a step beyond that. We need to be safe and redemptive. I want you to be free to share whatever you want, but more importantly, I want to then point you to Christ. That's the difference. We need to be safe and redemptive. So how can we do that? First of all, we need to just expect that this is present here in the body of Christ. It just not be so I still get people who are shocked. You know, I don't know how my best friend, and who I grew up, you know, together, has the same sex best friend, came from a good home, had Christian best friend, and homeschooled. Schooled. And I say, hold up, hold up. Are you really said if someone has good has good home, they have parents and their home and they're homeschooled, that they're exempt from struggling with sin? Is it true? Okay, okay, newsflash. I'm sensing in this room right now. I mean, they're not a big people group. I'm I'm sensing in this room there's probably at least one or two of you that's struggling with sin. I, I don't want to don't raise your hand. I don't want to embarrass you, you know. All right? I mean, okay, let's be real. We're all struggling with sin. This is, I mean, this is not anything new. And yet we are shocked some sometimes when we hear that someone's struggling with sin. <gasps> wow, I mean, how did that happen? I mean, is the body of Christ a group of people who've got it all together, have no problems? We meet once a week, we hold hands and we sing kumbaya. Is that what we are? Or is the body of Christ a group of people who know without a doubt that we are broken? And we need Jesus. I'll just be honest with you. I am broken and I need Jesus. Anyone else out there that relates to that at all? So let us all hand in hand walk together to him. Not because I can fix you. I can't. Not because I have all the answers. I don't. But let me tell you, I know someone who does. And his name is Jesus. And so we just need to, in solidarity, lock arms and walk to him. Yes, your struggle with sin might look a little bit different from mine or yours or whatever, but at the end of the day, even though they can be, they look a little bit different, at the end of the day, you know what we have in common? We all need Jesus. And that whatever proclivity struggle we're dealing with, Jesus is the answer. I mean, that's such, that might sound trite, but it is true. It is true, so let us just embrace that and, and realize that. Second, be able to articulate your position. And what I mean by this is not, it's bad, don't do it. I mean, you know, I often hear people you know, tell them, this is my position on homosexuality. It's sin. Like, that's it? You know, <laughs> like, like, that's all there is to it? You know, there's no, like, now what? I mean, how do we, you know, share Christ? I mean, it's sin. You just don't do it. Well, that's not really helpful to people, you know, and, and people who even say, I know it is, but now what? Let me tell you, I mean, if we're going to try to encapsulate my position, at least what I think is, is, is really the biggest takeaway of my position, it's this. My goal is to lead people into a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't want, you know, I don't say, do you know Jesus? Demons know Jesus, right? It's making no difference in their lives. So it's not about just knowing Jesus. It's about having a deeper daily relationship with Jesus Christ. For what reason? So that they're willing to surrender everything. It's about union with Christ and full surrender. That's what it's really about. And this applies to everything. I mean, that they're willing to surrender everything, including their sexuality. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. We don't want to do the first two things. We want to follow Jesus. We don't want to deny ourselves. We don't want to pick up our crosses daily. You can't follow Jesus if you don't do those first two things. Oh, but I'm not a super Christian. I'm not an apostle. That message from Jesus Christ isn't just for apostles. That's for everyone. Average Christian Joe, if you want to follow Jesus, deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow me. Following Jesus should cost us everything. If it hasn't, 
you're following the wrong Jesus. It's when you give up everything and then he allows you to keep some things, those things are no longer yours, they're all his. Third, maybe you have a friend who you've always wondered whether they're struggling with this and it's a good Christian friend of yours and you want to let them know you're there for them to walk with them through this. So how do you bring it up? Don't. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> if someone came up to you out of the blue and asked, are you gay? Awkward. I'll just let you know. Uh, even if you try to soften it, like, hey, do you have same-sex attractions? Still awkward. But what you can do is give assurance of your friendship. Let me tell you why most people who have same-sex attractions and are Christian that don't share, because they think if that they share with you, they're going to lose your friendship. So they don't say anything. But if you just give assurance of your friendship and say things, you know, like, I thank God for you, and I just want you to say nothing can change our friendship. That creates this environment of safety and transparency, where, and you're inviting them into that. We should be doing that with all of our close friends. Fourth, let's be a community that has zero talents on the joking and the bullying. There's no place in the Christian life where we can make fun and demean other people, even with our youth. You know, help them expand their vocabulary. Instead of saying, that's so gay. You know how you hear kids that say that all the time? That's so gay. I mean, and it has nothing to do with sexuality. That's so gay. That shirt is so gay. A shirt can't be gay. Right? <laughs> yeah, you know, let's, how about be more creative? Like, that's so Baptist or that's a Presbyterian. You know, think <laughs> something <laughs> very creative like that. Convicted, consistent, compassionate. Lastly, complete. And when I say complete, this is about complete in our message. What we say to others, you know, we have to be complete about our truth because it's the truth that sets us free. So what's the truth? Oh, it's sin. That's not the complete truth. You know, it's sin, period. That's equivalent to giving someone a one spiritual law track. You've heard of the four spiritual laws? This is one spiritual law that goes something like this. You're a sinner and you're going to hell. Sorry. That's not good news. You think that's ridiculous. Why would anyone say that? But if you think back, that's actually the message we have been giving to the gay community alone. You're a sinner. You're going to hell. There's no hope for you. It's no wonder why the gay community want nothing to do with us because we haven't been sharing them the good news. We have been sharing the bad news alone. We have, been not, we have not been telling them the complete truth. We have been telling them the incomplete truth. And telling someone an incomplete truth can be just as harmful as telling someone a lie. So what is the complete truth? 1 Corinthians 6, Paul says, Do not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's bad news. Then he lists 10 sins to those words, focus upon homosexual behavior, that oftentimes Christians will look at this list, zero in all those two words and say, Look, gays and lesbians won't inherit the kingdom of God. When we do that, we forget about the eight other sins conveniently. Because if we look at all 10 sins, none of us should inherit the kingdom of God. Bad news. I'm so glad Paul doesn't stop there. And he goes on to say in verse 11, one of my favorite verses, such were, catch that, past tense, some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the spirit of our God. That is not good news. That's amazing news. That's news that we can tell anyone that needs to know about Jesus Christ because this focuses on the most important thing, knowing Christ. Our friends in the gay community, their main issue is not their sexuality. Their main issue is to know Jesus and fully surrender to him. My biggest sin was not same-sex relationships. My biggest sin was unbelief. We need to make sure, that is what separated me from God. We need to make sure that we make the, the, the most important thing the most important thing, and that's faith in Christ or not. We have to be redemptive. And I'm just going to give you some uh, last things here, and we're going to kind of go through these pretty fast. Uh, so, but as, you know, many of you guys probably are here because you have a heart to minister to those in the gay community or those who have same-sex attractions. And one of the first things we need to do is not conflate everyone into one group because some know Christ, some don't know Christ. Some know that this is sin and some don't believe this is sin or they may, might even say they're Christian. So because that separates how we minister because on one side we would mentor, disciple, the other side would be outreach and sharing, sharing the true gospel. So let's first start with this first group. 
Christians who know this is sin, they have same-sex attractions, how would you respond when they come to you and share and open up? Let's say after this weekend you actually have a good friend that confides with you. What would you do? What would you do? What would you say? First thing, thank them that they trusted you with this, for them, a deep, dark secret. Second, tell them that they're not alone. Many feel like they have to go through life all alone and no one will ever understand them. And you can be honest. I don't know that much about this, but I want to learn. And then more importantly, tell them this, that I want to walk with you to Jesus no matter what. Those words right there can be life for someone. And you might, I think one of the biggest fears for many people when they, you know, when they think about this, they're like, I, I, I can't minister on this issue of same-sex attractions because I don't have them. You know, I mean, that seems pretty logical. But tell me, when is it that you actually have to struggle with some sin or actually have done that sin to help someone else? I mean, do you have to shoot up with heroin to help a heroin addict? Do you have to commit adultery before you help someone who's caught in adultery? Yes or no? No. You know what's the requirement? That you know Jesus and you've had some victory in your own life with sin. If you have those two requirements, you can help anyone. When someone comes to you in need, in desperate need, you know, they don't really need an expert. You know what they need? A friend. And you can be a friend. So, uh, tell them that not, not alone. Third, this could be the most important part of all these last few things, identity in Christ. We have bought into the lie that sexuality is who you are. Talk to your gay friends. When they talk about their sexuality, they never say, this is my behavior. Never. I've n I never said that when I lived as a gay man. This is not what I do. This is not what I feel. You'll, you won't hear those words come out of their mouth. What do they say instead? This is who I am. So this shift from what to who has created a radically distorted personhood. We are not our sexuality. It's certainly part of our experience. I'm not denying the significance of this, this strong attraction, feeling, desire. Yes, it's there. And it's certainly not even always sexual. It can be romantic, those, those desires, but they're still desires. Desires are not who we are then who, who are we? That's the next question. We are all created in the image of God. That's truly who we are. That image has been distorted by sin and the fall, but we need to start there, not start with this wrong view of personhood. Because when we start there, that's why all these views of how we live come out of this false view of who we are. So per first, every one of us need to realize our identity needs to be in Christ alone. Don't think, you know, in your mind, oh, I am gay, I am straight, I am this. No, I am a child of God. Amen? I mean, that's the best place we start. When we start with I am gay and, and, and that, this idea that this is who I am, well, then, of course, we're going to have, you know, and, you know, when you're off by a few degrees in the end, you're, you're off by a lot. We have to make sure that our compass is correct. Fourth, be realistic. Don't give these false promises that following Jesus is easy. It's hard. I tell people, it was a lot easier when I didn't know Christ. I did whatever I wanted. You know what I mean? I mean, how many of you guys know that? I mean, before I, I was a Christian, I did whatever I wanted. I didn't itch, I scratched it. I had a desire, I went for it. Now I have a heavenly father that I want to please, and I have an enemy nipping at my heels. But let me tell you the difference. My hope, my joy, contentment is not bound up in what's going on in my life right now. My hope is in the rock. That's the difference. Things can happen around me, but I can still have my feet on the rock. That's the difference. Fifth, don't focus on the externals, like about how they walk and their mannerisms. I mean, that's not the core issue. The core issue is whether God's renewing their heart. That's the most important. And I want to see change from the inside out. Six, encourage God-honoring same-sex friendships. I mean, next to my identity in Christ, this would be the second most important thing. I needed to relearn how to love other men, not in sexual ways, not in romantic ways, not in codependent ways, but in the way that God intended. At the core, I mean, we're all created to desire intimacy with others of the same sex. The world diminishes that. 
and downplays that. But it's a real desire, a good desire. So really at the core, it's a legitimate need only fulfilled in an illegitimate way. I think all sin is a legitimate need fulfilled in an illegitimate way. So that's kind of ministering to Christians who have same-sex attractions. Well, how, well, how do we then share Christ with those in the gay community? Or, I mean, there's this kind of, we feel as this middle ground, people who say they're gay and Christian and they think it's okay. Honestly, 70% of Americans say they're Christian. Just because someone says that they're Christian, we, I mean, yes, we, we want to take their word for it, but we need to look at their life. I mean, if 70% of Americans were truly Christians, I mean, we wouldn't have to you know, share. I mean, our, our churches would be overflowing if the 70% of Americans were Christian. That's not true, right? I mean, I wish that were true. It's not. So we need to, just because they say that, we need to look, also look at their life. And if they're not, and even though they say they're Christian and we see their lives don't match up with it, well, then we see that they're holding to a false gospel. And so then we want to share them the gospel. So that's why I would put even the gay Christians who think that it's okay, I would still put them in this other category. So how do we share Christ and the true gospel with these? First, let me tell you what not to do. Do not compare this with an addiction, pedophilia. Or I know many people are like, well, this is like a, any other sin. You know, this is a sin like any other sin, like murder. You know, like <laughs> people who are gay don't appreciate that. You know, <laughs> that's not going to help them, you know, to come to Christ. Also, don't use these two words, lifestyle and choice when you're engaging with those in the gay community, or even non-Christians. For some, that's even offensive, because why? They have the wrong identity. Because as a matter of fact, instead of us approaching this with unbelievers, first, as behavior, which it is, but when we do that, but when they have the wrong identity, and we talk about behavior, it's like we're talking at two different planes. As I think instead of talking about behavior, let's talk about identity first, because that then more readily goes in the conversation of God. Because we need to talk about God first before we talk about his morals. If we first talk about morality, that's legalism. And that is not going to save you. But it is God and Jesus Christ and faith in him that's going to lead to salvation. So don't, also third, don't say love the sin or hate the sin. <laughs> Do it. Don't say it. You know, I mean, when you look, I, I don't know how many times, you know, and, and even if you're guilty of this, that's fine. But when, I just want to let you know, when you tell someone, I love you, but I hate your sin, they don't feel loved. You know, <laughs> they just hear the but part, and, and then it's, they don't hear the first part. Fourth, don't feel the need that you have to debate all the time with people. Like Christians are like, you know, they just ask me, is this sin? And I, I have to tell them. Not necessarily. I look at Jesus Christ. He did not answer every question. And there was a reason, because when people asked, he, being God, knew their heart. And if they were not ready to receive this truth, he didn't always answer. Pilate, he was silent. When the crowds asked him questions, he would have answered in parables. I mean, but when he was with the disciples and the disciples asked him a question, he spoke plainly. And he gave the answer. We need to use, we need to use godly discernment to know what's the difference. I don't think that we should never answer a question. That's the other mistake. We just need to know when is the right time because when they do ask a question and God has begun working in their life, like, like these teachable disciples, he spoke plainly and explained. So when people come at you and say, do you think this is sin? It's okay to deflect and say, I don't feel like we have to debate all the time. I value our, our friendship more than that. But if someone does come to you and say, hey, what does the word of God say? You have this open door to speak plainly in someone's life. So what should you do? We'll just finish with this. First, we need to pray and fast. There's so much that happens in prayer. You guys saw the movie War Room, that, that wonderful movie? So that movie was turned into a novel, and the person who wrote that is Chris Faber. He has a, he's on the radio as well, but he wrote that. And when he wrote that um, on the, you know, uh, kind of the dedication page, him and uh, the Kendrick brothers, he kind of did it with the Kend Kendrick brothers, uh, but he had his dedication, and he dedicated it to my mom. Do battle for people in your life who can't do battle. Pray and fast. Second, listen. Don't be quick to speak, but be quick to listen. Sometimes we just, we want to speak, and then we're surprised why they don't want to listen, because we haven't listened ourselves. Third, be intentional. Don't be afraid to go across the street and invite your gay neighbor over for dinner. And I know the biggest hindrance oftentimes is you think when we do that, we're condoning their sin. But let me tell you, last time I checked, we usually have sinners over for dinner. 
right? I mean, think about it. Nothing new. You're not sinning with them. I mean, if you're, you know, if you're inviting them over and doing drugs with them, I don't do that. You know, I mean, that would be sin. <laughs> but if you're just eating with them, that's not sin. I mean, you know, so it's, it's just differentiating the two. Having someone for dinner isn't condoning their sin. Third, fourth, be patient and persistent. It's going to take time. Don't treat people like their pet project. We need to just be in it for the long haul and wait for God to work in their life. I often tell parents, sometimes you need to exercise the spiritual gift of waiting. God does the change, not us. And just be patient and persistent. Lastly, be transparent. Share what God is doing in your life. Because people can argue about all, you know, you open up your Bible, they can argue with you doc- about doctrine, but you know what? They can't argue what God's doing in your life this week, this month, this year. We should not be the same as we were 10 years ago, 10 months ago, or even 10 weeks ago. God should be continually transforming us. I would never have considered the gospel if I didn't see the gospel lived out in my parents' lives. I didn't leave pursuing same-sex relationships because my parents convinced me this was sinful. I left it because I was shown something better, and his name is Jesus. Our job is to show a dying world out there that no matter what they're clinging to, all the fool's gold in the world, a job, career, a spouse, children, no no matter what they're clinging to, no, no matter is Jesus better than all of that, but Jesus is best. So the biggest takeaway is that you go and live your life in a way on a daily basis and show the world it is unmistakable in your life that not only is Jesus better, but Jesus is best. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for how good you are to us. Help us, God, to be just light and salt for your glory. We love you and ask this in Jesus' name. Why don't we just take a short break? I know I've gone over. Um, Can we do like maybe five minutes? And then we'll be back uh, for Nature Nurture, and then Pastor Josh and I will come up to do question and answer. Thanks. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for um, your truth. It's just you bless us with your word, Christ, who is your living word. There's so much that we can mine and gather from, Lord. Help us to grow from it. Let us not just to be hearers, but doers. We praise you and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this next talk, Nature and Nurture, we're going to answer the question, or, or at least look at the question, are people born gay? Are people chose to be gay? What, how did they become gay? That, that seems to be such a part of, you know, what, what are factors that influence the development of, of, of sexuali- sexuality and, and stuff like that? So is it nature or is it nurture? There's a lot of notes, and we're going to go through a little fast so we can uh, get, get to some of the questions. <clears throat> but um, so scan this QR code or jot down the shortened URL that's at the bottom there. There has been a lot of emphasis, not only within the body of Christ, you know, among Christians, but especially among those who aren't Christian. And, and, and kind of the logic flows like this, well, If people are born gay, or if it is biological, or if it is genetic, well, then they can't help it. That's just who they are. And if it is who they are, then there's nothing wrong with being gay or being straight or or whatever. That's usually kind of the logic that flows like this. On the other spectrum, remember how we have this this kind of pendulum that brings, you know, we have pendulum over here, pendulum over here. We have then people who will say, well, no, it's not genetic. It's not, you know, or people, some people will even say they chose that. And if we kind of think that that's how they become gay or even that they have same-sex attractions, same-sex attractions, same-sex attractions, that they chose that, then the logical step would be, well, then they can unchoose it. Or others kind of in this area, that they'll say, well, uh, Okay, yeah, they didn't choose it, but they became that way because, you know, of something that happened when they grew up. Something happened, you know, in their childhood or, or whatever, and, 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 you know, or they didn't really mature fully in that certain area. And if we can just help them mature in that area, then they become normal again. Or, you know, I mean, all this. So really, 
How we diagnose this, how we see, you know, what is the cause will greatly impact our approach, the way that we would minister to someone. A correct diagnosis leads to a correct approach. If you guys, you know, if you happen to wake up tomorrow morning and you just have this horrible fever and a cough or whatever it is, and you just feel just really bad, and it goes on for several days, it would make sense that you would go see a doctor. Or let's just say, you know, you've just had some, you know, weird pain going on in your stomach and you just don't know what it is and it's been going on for months, you probably want to go see the doctor. Why would you want to go see the doctor? I mean, of course, you, you want that pain to go away, but for me, I want that doctor to figure out what's wrong. We would call that diagnose. I want the doctor to diagnose me correctly. For what reason? Just to say, well, that's what you have, and then, okay, thanks, you know, here's my bill. <laughs> no, I want the doctor to not only diagnose me correctly, but then be able to give me the correct treatment. Correct diagnosis leads to correct treatment. What if this doctor diagnosed me incorrectly? That incorrect diagnosis is going to lead to an incorrect treatment. And I believe that, generally speaking, we have diagnosed this in correctly. And when we diagnose this incorrectly, this leads then to an incorrect approach, an incorrect treatment. So we're going to look at this, nature or nurture. Both sides of, you know, or all sides, people who hold to all different beliefs, they have research and data and studies to back up what they believe. What we want to do this evening is look at all this research and glean from what can we learn from that. I've had a lot of background in, in health sciences. If you remember, I was just three months away from getting my doctorate, and being typical Asian people, they think, what a waste. I mean, all that education, no degree, right? I mean, that's like, you know, that's worse than, you know, murdering someone. So, you know... Asians, it's all about the degrees and, and numbers and, or letters that you have after your name. So, uh, you know, yes, I've, I went through years of schooling and no degree. I, I actually got into dental school before getting my bachelor's because I got accepted, actually, to graduate school, to dental school, without getting my bachelor's degree because I got accepted and I started it because I thought, I don't need a bachelor's degree if I'm going to get a doctorate. I mean, wh who needs a bachelor's if I'm going to have my doctorate? I'm, and so if I'm going to get it sooner, why not jump into that? I mean, I, I was going to get my doctorate when I was 20 years old. But then, as you know, the rest of the story, that didn't turn out. God had done other plans. Uh, but all this, you know, all these hours, undergrad hours and graduate school, no degree, no associates, no, no, no bachelor's, no master's, no doctorate, nothing, just lots and lots of debt. But... I love it how God takes something that the world sees as waste and use it for his glory. Because who knew years, decades down the road that I would be called to this type of ministry and actually be able to use all that knowledge that I have in the health sciences and statistics for this ministry when it comes to homosexuality. I mean, there's a lot of research behind homosexuality. And if I would have no background, I wouldn't really be able to understand it and teach it and be able to kind of explain it uh, in just lay common terms. So I love it how God takes things that were all considered waste of the world. So we're going to look at the studies, but at the very, very end, I'm going to do something that actually isn't done much, unfortunately. I've heard many talks on this where they talk about this research and they say, this is what the research says. But then what we seldom do, which I think is actually the most important thing, is to have theological reflection. In light of all this, you know, uh, this body of research, which is a lot, we see what this body of research says, but then we need to then go to God's Word. I mean, shouldn't we always do that? But somehow when it comes to this, we skip over that. So we're going to talk about the research and then talk about, the, have some theological reflection at the very end. So we're going to start... And all this research, there's, I'm kind of breaking it out to two groups. One is a bigger group of, of, of study and research, and the other one is smaller. The first one are, is research that, that looks at possible biological 
factors, causes, possible causes that are biological. That's a bigger group. Smaller group is more environmental. So we're going to first look at the biological ones. And this is studies that focus on possible causes, biological causes. And those would be genetic, um, hormonal, prenatal, and, uh, you know, in the womb, what happens in their brain, etc. So one of the first studies looks at twins. And why twins? Because identical twins share identical genes. I mean, we have fraternal twins in here, right? It, Pastor Josh's, they, the fraternal twins aren't identical twins. Identical twins share identical genes. Fraternal twins share about uh, maybe up to 50% same genetic material. Siblings don't share as much as fraternal twins do when it comes to genes. They share less than that. So what researchers usually do when they're trying to figure out whether genes play a role in the development of some certain trait, they will look at twins. That's actually probably the first thing that usually uh, researchers do. They will look at a group of identical twins, a group of fraternal twins. And usually it's where these groups of twins, at least one of them, has that certain trait. So Bailey and Pilar did a study and they looked at twins, identical twins, fraternal twins, where at least one of them identified as gay. So in this group, what they found when they looked at you know, these, these groups, they looked at, well, what's the percentage where both of them are gay in their study group? Well, it turned out to be for, for identical twins, it was 52%. When they compared to, for, to fraternal twins, it was not as high. And when usually when you see a study like that, what that tells us is that Genetics could play some role. The mistake that people often make then is when they see that big difference is they, are, they, they jump to the conclusion and say, it is genetic, which is a mistake. To say that something is genetic is saying that that is the cause for this trait. And the only way we could say that is if in this study for identical twins, that all twins share that trait all the time. That's not the case here. We can say hair color is genetic. Why? One way to prove that is looking at identical twins and sharing, seeing what's the percentage where one identical twin has a certain hair color and what's the percentage that the other identical twin has that same hair color. You tell me. 100%. 100% of the time. So in that case, we can conclusively say hair color is genetic. We can say the same thing about eye color. We can't say the same thing about sexuality, at least according to this study. So first of all, it's not 100%. So therefore, we can't say that, that, that this is genetic. I mean, that, that verb is important. Is meaning it's like an equal sign. I mean, unless you're Bill Clinton, then that's a different, it can have a different meaning. But so is, I mean, it means, you know, it is genetic. So genetic is the main factor, but that's not the case here. We, but we, that we, can, we could say that it is a genetic factor. There could, could be a genetic link. One weakness of the study, though, that is that we can't extrapolate this to the general population. So even though we have this 52%, you know, it's not that then, oh, then all the time, this, this is, you know, that twins, that's the percentage where identical twins, where both of them will be gay. No, that, that's, that's the reason is because when they were doing this study and asking people to participate in their study, they advertised strictly in gay magazines. They advertised uh, in the, uh, you know, in Boys Town in Chicago, where that, that was basically where they advertised in group. And not that they couldn't do that, but, you know, as Pastor Bill knows, I mean, that's a highly concentrated a amount of people in Boys Town in, in the gay community in Chicago. And, and certainly they were doing a demographic study, but the mistake that people who, you know, weren't part of that study, like uh, lay people, they'll make the mistake and say, well, this applies across the board. So in a sense, the applicant pool was biased. So if we want to do a more general study that applies maybe across the board, we would need to do a study that, that isn't just focused upon a certain demographic. So Bailey Dunn and Martin 2000 did another study and it was, it was in Australia. And they got a list of all the twins in Australia. And they sent every one of the, a letter. And they asked them to participate in the study. So whenever you do a, a, a pioneer study, it's, it, results are very interesting. But what needs to be done to confirm those results is it needs to be replicated. Replicated means that not only is the study done again, but the conclusions are similar. That's what we call a study is replicated. So Bailey, Dunn, and Martin, 2000, this was trying to replicate the study, but when they came up to their you know, results, 
they didn't find that 52% of their identical twins where both were gay. They found out that it was only 30%. So it's not, you know, it, that, there's still quite a bit of difference. They couldn't even replicate that 30% either. So Bierman and Bruckner in 2002 did another study, and it turned out it was 6.7%. So we have all these numbers that are all over the place. So basically, it's saying nothing's conclusive. We can't say anything has been replicated yet. Langstrom and, and his colleagues in 2008 did a study in Sweden, and this to date is the largest twin study of same-sex sexual behavior attempted so far. They looked at 3,826 pairs of identical twins and fraternal twins in Sweden. I mean, I'm like, do that many people live in Sweden? I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's <laughs> So they looked at all these twins in Sweden, and they weren't looking for what's the percentage where both twins were gay. They were actually trying to find out some other data to figure out, well, what's how would you break down, you know, what's how each part is an influence in developing a certain trait? So they broke it down to genetics and other non-genetic factors like shared environment and individual specific environment, specific environment. So for men, genetics, they believe, played 34 to 39%, whereas uh, the shared environment for men, they believe, was 0%. Individual specific environment, they believe, played about 61 to 66%. So you might be thinking, what's the difference between shared environment and individual specific environmental factors? So shared environmental factors are, are factors that cause siblings to be, more, to, more, to be more similar to one another. Individual specific environment are influences that cause siblings to be a little bit different from, from one another. So among men, it's that breakdown. For women, they believe it was different. For women, they believe genetics plays less of a role, 18 to 19%. Shared environment is about 16 to 17%. And then individual specific environment was about the same, 64 to 66%. Now, in their study, at their conclusion, they had this to say. They said, although wide confidence intervals suggest cautious interpretation, so I know you might be thinking, what in the world is a confidence interval? Well, let me, let me explain what that is in just a moment. They said the results are consistent with moderate primarily genetic familial effects and moderate to large effects of the non-shared environment. So let me tell you what shared, uh, confidence interval means. Confidence interval is a statistical term. Any of you guys that are statisticians out there? No statisticians? They're like a different breed of people. I mean, they, you know, it's like accountants. I mean, I, I don't, I, none of that makes sense to me, you know, numbers and stuff. Statisticians are just a different breed of people. Uh, you know, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's really, comp it's like IRS. I, it just doesn't make sense. So statisticians, uh, you know, when they look at a confidence interval, uh, Technically, it's an estimated range of values that include an unknown population parameter. That's the like, definition of it, and I know that doesn't make sense. So let me give you a word that's similar to that. How many of you guys have heard the, the term margin of error? I, guess for, I mean, everyone, we've heard that term. So margin of error means when you have, like a, let's say, a survey um, or a poll, right? You know, when the pr presidential election was going on, they had all these polls that were going out. And if you read the polls, there's always fine print that say margin of error, plus or minus 3%, 4%. That's actually pretty accurate. You'll never find anything that's plus or minus 0%. So when you have a wide margin of error, that means this study or this poll is not accurate. I mean, it's not reliable. They need to collect more data to be more precise. Same thing with Marge, uh, with a confidence interval. The wider the confidence interval, the less accurate, the less precise, meaning that you need to collect more data before you can really come up with a good conclusion. So wide confidence interval is not so good. Narrow is better when it comes to research. So how wide is this confidence interval? Genetics was zero to 59%. So that's like plus or minus 30% you know, margin of error. That's pretty wide. That's really, really wide. Shared environment was 0 to 46% confidence interval. Individual specific environment was 41 to 85%. So we see that this is really, so their data, their conclusion was actually kind of a stab in the dark. It wasn't very accurate and precise. What I want to know was what's the percentage where one twin is gay that the other twin was gay as well. 
I had to do kind of look at all their numbers and do the math myself. And it came out to, when it comes to men, it was about 10%. For about women, it was about 12%. But what's interesting was they actually, in their survey, never asked the question whether they're gay. They did ask, Did you ever have a same-sex partner? And part of that reason was they didn't want to give the impression that this study was on homosexuality because that could influence the way that people then answer later questions. They wanted to keep it as unbiased as possible. So the downside is, well, we don't know for certain whether all these people were gay or not because simply having a same-sex partner doesn't mean that you're gay. Could mean that you're bi, could mean you're experimenting, whatever it is. However, of all the studies, I think... You know, when it comes to this, this percentage, I think is, more un, is, is one of the more unbiased ones. Overall, just from these studies, we see that it looks like genetics and environment play some role. How much exactly? Nothing's been replicated or, um, con- con- is, or is conclusive. Another group of studies look at the brain. Simon LeVay in 1991 looked at the hypothalamus. And uh, it's believed that the hypothalamus regulates sexual behavior in animals. And since we're just more evolved animals, according to science uh, or people who hold to the, you know, that view, then, then therefore they look at the hypothalamus. So th- we, they looked at 41 cadavers, and they actually took the hypothalamus out, and they measured it, they weighed it, and et cetera. What they found, and they broke it down to three different groups, uh, gay men, Straight men, straight women. And if you look on my slide, I put presumed there because the only reason why they put the straight men and straight women there was because in their medical records, it didn't say that they were gay, which I don't know if you know this or not, but it's a little difficult to ask a cadaver whether they're gay or not. (laughs) You know, just saying. So it's not conclusive whether they certainly was, were in those categories or not. It's just whatever was in the records. They look at the different neuron groups. There are four different neuron groups in the hypothalamus, and they found that in one of the neuron groups, the INAH3 group, that that neuron group appeared to be twice as big in the straight male group when compared to the gay male group and the female group. So they tried to do that study again, and people couldn't, they didn't find that same result. It wasn't replicated. Simon LeVay had this to say in his study. He said, it's important to stress what I did not find. I did not prove that homosexuality is genetic or find a genetic cause for being gay. I didn't show that gay men are born that way. The most common mistake people make in interpreting my work. Nor did I locate a gay center in the brain. Since I look at adult brains, we don't know if the difference I found were there at birth or they appeared later. Another group of studies look at chromosomes, hammer who Magnuson and their colleagues in 1993 looked at 76 gay brothers and appeared to be more gay relatives on the mother's side of the family. So they looked at the X chromosome, and when they studied the X chromosome, they found there was a portion of the X chromosome where 83% of the time that they had that same portion. You know what this was popularly called? The gay gene. Like, we found the gay gene. They didn't find the gay gene. I don't know. You guys remember in 1993 on the cover of Time magazine, this made it. We found the gay gene. They didn't. I mean, I remember I was 23 years old, and I read that magazine. This is when I was out. I, I had come out at that time, and I was like, oh, my goodness, we found, finally found the gay gene. So this is a good lesson for us when it comes to reading, like, t- you know, Time magazine and Newsweek, you know, those, you know, those the magazines that are just so known for scientific research and stuff. Um, when you read those, I mean, continue to read those. I mean, and actually continue to read all the, you know, all the media out there. I think it's good to read those things. The best lesson that we need to know is when you read that, do your best to go back to the primary source. I mean, we need to do that. And honestly, I don't want to blame the reporters. I feel sorry for reporters sometimes. You know, they have to churn out. You know what I mean? I mean, you know, when you're a journalist, you know what your time schedule is? You've got to report and you've got to turn something in in like 10 hours. You got to write it all, do the research, and I mean, it's crazy what they have to do. I mean, I feel sorry for them. I, and you know, on, on both sides of media, whether you sit, sit on this side or that side, I mean, still, it's not easy. So, we need to help them. I mean, you r- read the information, do your best to g- always go back to the source. And when it comes to scientific research, you can do that. It's amazing what's online now. 
you can go online and find all this great information. You guys remember back in high school? I don't know if, you know, in high school when, if, if they had this. But I know when I went to high school in, in the 80s, in the late 80s, they had um, cliff notes. You guys, you guys remember those? Okay. You know, I, I never used those. I had some friends who used those. So cliff notes, you know, the, the good thing is you get a nice summary. But the bad thing is you don't know who wrote it. You know, I mean, it's, it, you don't know exactly. It could be accurate. I mean, I, I think most generally speaking, they are accurate. But sometimes they, they would put in their, in, you know, bias in it. The amazing thing that I learned in my doctoral research is something that's like the cliff notes of research. And it's called abstracts. Have you guys heard of abstracts? Abstracts are amazing. They're, they're like, they put in 500 words or whatever, all you need to know about this 50-page document of research, you know, it's, and, and all, you know, I read that, and I would say, oh, this has got some information that I would, would, you know, this research can be helpful, and that statement is not written by someone who wrote, like, cliff notes, where you, like, you don't know who it is. It's written by the researchers themselves, so they will get all the data right, so when you read something, you know, in Time Magazine or Newsweek or whatever, I mean, in, in the Chicago Tribune, Go back, especially when it comes to research, go back and, and Google it online, and you could probably find that abstract and actually get the most accurate information. So people tried to replicate this study about the, the, the X chromosome. People couldn't replicate the study. 1999, Bailey and his colleagues tried to do it. McKnight and Malcolm also tried to do this as well. So overall, all these studies, there's tons, tons more, and I can't focus on all of them, but I focus on some of these that are really foundational that people have built on. We're going to now look at these environmental studies, more of these that are uh, sociological, cultural, developmental, familial factors. Uh, you know, do those influence or cause someone to be gay? When we look at the twin studies, we found, in especially the Sweden, the one done in Sweden, we found that environmental factors play some role as well. Well, what about familial factors? Many of you guys might have heard in the past where people will say, and you might even hear this on radio, where people will say, homosexuality is primarily due to an absentee father, a dominant mother, or child abuse in, 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 their, in their past. You got anyone hear that before? I mean, it's, it's, we probably hear that a lot, you know, where that's why people turn gay. You know, you, you, you look at someone who's gay and you just look into their past and you find that, you know, the parents had a bad relationship or whatever, they didn't have a good relationship with their dad. And, and so we jump to the conclusion that is what made them gay or that's what caused them to be gay. People, there's many people who hold to that view. Uh, I mean, when I say many, uh, you know, there's still, Still, you know, a good amount of people who do hold to that view. A lot of them that, that are, are Christian, they say that's why people are gay. And then they'll actually list some research. And they'll list, like this, uh, this, this research here, a whole bunch of uh, different ones. And they'll say, you know, there's research that proves that. A weakness of this is when you look at this list, one of the first things we can notice are those dates. I intentionally put those dates there. Research is important to look at the date when that research was done because the way they did things 20 years ago when it comes to methodology is just can be different. We have different kind of guidelines now to help keep studies more precise and accurate and reliable and unbiased that didn't have those guidelines in place in the 50s or in the past or even 20 years ago. So one of the down, downsides, I mean, actually, it's kind of sad, but in research, we know that any study more than 10 years ago is just considered outdated, and you don't use that or cite that unless it's a foundational study that people have built on. So you see right away that these are a bit outdated. Another downside is all of these studies happen to be from people who are studying their own clients. Nothing wrong with that, but what they're doing is our case studies. A case study is not the same thing as a study on causation. They're just totally different methods and, and guidelines for doing a case study, which is, I mean, there's not many guidelines for doing case studies, but when it comes to doing a study on causation, there's just, you know, you follow a totally different methodology and a totally different way of getting people to participate in your study. With that said, though, I do find it interesting that when you look at this list, um, you find... I'll go back to the other list, to the list. Uh, you, uh, 
you find here, you know, in this list, uh, you have the Jonas Brothers in 1944, and you have Justin Bieber in 62. Who knew that they were researchers? Um, you have Kendler and Thornton doing uh, a study on twins. They believe it could be a factor. Uh, Lung and Shu in 2007 looked at uh, Taiwanese military, and they believe that paternal protection, maternal care could have an influence. So all these other studies look at childhood gender nonconformity, urban versus rural, uh, you know, so all, you know, there's more of these studies. Now, I kind of just flew through these. One of the reasons is because there's not a lot of studies focused on environmental factors, which I think there needs to be more. But I didn't really critique them other than the things that I s first said. And there's still a few other things that I want to say, especially when it comes to the belief that it is parenting or bad parenting that causes or influences or, you know, is the main factor for someone developing same-sex attractions. I think one of the biggest problems is that it confuses correlation with causation. It confuses correlation with causation. What's the difference? Causation is when there's a direct influence where one factor or multiple factors actually bring about something else. We call that cause and effect. Correlation is not exactly the same thing. Correlation is when there's some type of influence between two variables. So if one variable, as it increases, causes, you know, we find that the other one, not causes, but when we see one variable increases and at the same time the other variable increases as well, we would call that a positive correlation. If one variable increases and the other one, the other one decreases, then we call that a, ne a negative correlation. Correlation could, correlation could be caused, it could be indirect, and the indirect and it could be caused, correlation could be Correlation does not, does not necessarily mean causation. causation. Let me give you, give you an illustration that might help illustrate, 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 let me give you the difference between correlation and causation. In New York City, it's been shown by researchers that when there's an increase in the consumption of ice cream, at the same time, murder rates go up. Crazy, right? Yeah. yeah. Increase in the consumption of ice cream at the same time. Yeah. Time increase. Of ice cream. So, so we have increase. I think that's crazy. Crazy. Eating ice cream does not cause you to kill people. Well depending on what flavor you eat. But, you know, it just doesn't. So we can actually eliminate cause and effect. We're left with two other options, indirect and coincidental. And we'll actually eliminate, eliminate coincidental. Why? Because this has been replicated over and over and over. Researchers have shown, and it, it all agreed with one, with one another, that when, in, when, in, when increasing the, the consumption of ice, consumption of ice cream, at the same time, murder rates go up. So we're left with indirect, meaning there's an, another third factor that we're not, you know, we've kind of disregarded in this study that is influencing the two, that, that's causing both of the increase at the same time. Time. Anyone, anyone guess what that is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, hot with, hot with warm weather, summertime, you know. So when it gets hot, what do you want to do? Kill each other, right? <laughs> I mean, you want to cool off, you know, come up to Wisconsin where it's cooler, and, you know, you want to jump in the pool, go to the lake, whatever, do, you know, eat ice cream, cool off. So in the cities where during the summertime every year, ice cream sale, but also during this time, what, what always happens, it, all, it happens in Chicago too. Crime rate, rate goes up as well during the summertime. summertime. And there's many reasons for that. It's people, you know, gangs are more, are more active. There are more people. And more people. Gangs are more active. There's more tension. There's more, there's more rob happen. And all, and the, and the, all of these things. It is hotter, so, so first could ease easier flare. But you said could ease these two variables. Two variables is not cause. Not cause that there's something. These something else that's causing causing them both to go up at the same time. So that's correlation, not causation. So to prove causation, you need more research. You need to make research. You need to make sure you're isolating the control group off. Make control group off. I'm isolating the isolate that there's no other group, no other factors and there's factors, no other, no other or. Or you know any human, tra it is it is so hard to isolate all factors. You know, I mean, these pharmacological studies. Is I I give you a sugar pill, sugar pill and you. Pill. I are just so complicated. I, so 
But when it comes to this understanding of this belief that you know, absentee father or dominant mother is the cause for homosexuality, I've got just some anecdotal data that doesn't line up with that. For example, I could go to a community where that's pretty much the norm. You know, absentee father, dominant mother, like the inner city. And if that is the cause for homosexuality, we should be able to go into that community and see a much higher incidence rate of homosexuality. Do we see that? We don't. What do we see, though? A higher incidence of a lot of other things, like drug abuse, drug abuse like, like other things, like, like, like you, know, you know, banging, banging, and, banging and heterosexual, heterosexual promiscuity, homosexual promiscuity, I mean, I mean, but not, 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 not greater, greater than the other ones. It's, the ones, it's just all to me. You know what that communicates? You know what that communicates? That commun communicates to me that ch children need our best and best rest raised when they, when the other one, and a mother, and mother, when. That's how they are. That does not, not mean that a single father or a single mother can't raise their children, but isn't it harder? Right? We'll admit. I mean, it's harder. And when they don't have that environment, children are just more susceptible to other things because of that environment. But that is not the cause. You know what I see that is? It's a catalyst. I'm using all these kind of chem chemistry terms. I'm, you know, that's, I'm Ch Chinese, so it's science. You know, it's my, the language that I speak. But I see this not as a cause, but more as a catalyst. So it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's not that this, and this is so important for us because in our Christian culture, we have just added guilt and shame to parents of prodigals, to parents who have children who embraced uh, sexuality as who they are and made them feel guilty for their children. I think this has done more harm than help. I don't know how often I have parents that come to me and they're like, my son's gay. What did I do wrong? And they're breaking down crying and it's like, you know, if I went to all my son's soccer games, would that have helped? And I'm like, no. You know, <laughs> you could have like held his hand all the way from birth to 18 and he's still a sinner, right? I mean, <laughs> think about this. Perfect parenting doesn't guarantee perfect children. I don't know what got into our minds to think that if you just did everything right as a parent, you'll all of a sudden just produce godly children. Right? That's a lie. Parents, you know, even in this room, if you have a prodigal, it's not your fault. Godly parents never guarantees godly children. Look at Adam and Eve. Think about it, right? Did they not have a perfect father? Did they not have a perfect environment, the Garden of Eden? They still rebelled. What makes us think we could do any better? And let me tell you a secret. The job of a Christian parent, young or old, I mean, whether you've got little ones or whether you've got adult children, the job of a Christian parent is not to produce godly children. That's not your main job. You know what your job is as a Christian parent? Is to be a godly parent. There's a big difference. Your sole responsibility, you can't control your children to be godly, but you know what you can control? You be godly yourself. Be that example. I'm not at all saying that parents cannot influence their children. They can. But at the end of the day, they must make that decision of whether they're going to follow Jesus or not. Amen? Amen. So even those of you that have little ones, yes, you want your child to be godly and follow Jesus, but you know what? At some point in their life, when they're teenagers, when they're off to college, they have to make that decision. You can't make that. You, I mean, I, I wish we could do that, right, parents? Make that decision for your kids to do this or do that. Ain't going to happen. But you know what you can do? Be that godly example. It's not your fault. Just be. So this idea that somehow the absentee father dominant number is the cause that's not really the thing. So uh, there's some other things when it comes to um, 
some of these biological factors because it might seem radical, you know, especially among Christians to say that there could be a biological influence in this because they mistake me as saying that this, I'm saying that people are born gay or that it is purely genetic. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that according to just the research, it looks like to, that there could be some biological factors, but it looks like there, there could also be some other factors. So it can't all be biological. And we also confuse that this born gay question is the same. It's actually, they're linked, but they're actually different questions. What we're looking at right now are what are the factors? born gay question is not a what question. It's actually a when question. And follow me for a moment. The born gay question is asking when do these causative factors influence a person? When? If it's all before they're born, then and only then can we say that someone is born gay. You following me? But if some of these factors are after and some of them are before, we cannot say then that people are born gay because then it's not all before they're born. So it's important because the pop culture has kind of confused the two and conflated what are the factors with, with being born gay. I would say most people jump to the conclusion that we have proven that people are born gay. We have not. We haven't even proven or understood what are the factors. If we don't know what are the factors, there's no way in the world we can go to the next step, which is understanding whether people are born gay. That's really important. So I'm not seeing people are born gay, but people then say, well, if I'm not saying that they're born gay, and am, I, am I saying that they chose to be gay? Like we think those are the only two options. They either are born gay or they chose it. Th these are the wrong two choices. There are some other, more, uh, other choices, which is that it could be complex. You know, you know, it's not their choice either. That when we talk about choice and sexuality, that really oversimplifies a really complex issue because what are we talking about that they chose? They, did they choose their feelings? No, I didn't choose these feelings. Did I choose to respond to those and act on them? Yes. But when someone doesn't have this Christian framework to think through the difference between temptation, behavior, sin, identity, all these things, they can't think in that way. Third is, you know, we need to realize that when it comes to sexuality and all these studies, actually they, they, there's a, a, they fall short a bit and there's a bit of weakness in that. We're trying to do these objective studies when there's no objective test. There's no objective test for sexuality. I mean, think about this. Is there a blood test for homosexuality? No, I'll just let you know, no. <laughs> is there an x-ray for homosexuality? No. Is there, you know, if, if someone was silent and didn't speak, could I determine whether they're gay or not? No, and, and we shouldn't do that. I mean, we shouldn't judge people if they don't say that they are. The only way... The only way that I know whether someone is gay or not is if they tell me, right? That's the only way. And that's a more experiential, subjective way of determination, not objective. And that, not that you can't do a study related to that, but it makes it more complex because what you're doing is you're trying to do more quantitative methods to study a qualitative reality. Because when it comes down to it, when people jump to this conclusion and say, well, we have proven that people are born gay, that says much more than science has proven. As a matter of fact, if we have, you know, if we have proven that people are born gay, we should be able to go into the local hospital and go into the newborn baby clinic area. And instead of you picking out the boy babies and the girl babies, you should be able to pick out the gay babies and the straight babies. You can't, right? I mean, is that possible? Not yet. If we've, you know, proven that people are born gay, then when a doctor gives birth to a baby, baby, instead of saying, look, it's a boy, it's a girl, we should be able to say, look, it's gay, it's straight. We can't do that. So that means that there's much more research that has to be done. And as a matter of fact, I don't even think that research can prove anything conclusively. So with all of that in mind, with all that research, let's look at now what scripture says 
does this line up with Scripture, that it could be complex and it could be, you know, involving of, of many other factors? As a matter of fact, I do not believe we can fully understand human sexuality until we first understand what it means to be human according to the Bible. We call that biblical anthropology. It's a big word. Use that to impress your friend next time. You know, we study about biblical anthropology. Basically, you know, that might sound complicated, but it's really not. It basically means what it means to be human in light of the Bible, right? Anthropology is the study of humanity. We all know that. Biblical anthropology means the study of humanity through the lens of Scripture, which means we're all created in the image of God, Genesis 1. I wish that was the end of the story, right? That's not the end of the story. Genesis 3 came around. It's like, why did you have to eat the fruit? <laughs> you know what I mean? And I loved what happened later. You know, Adam is like, it's this woman you gave me. You know, nice, Adam, you know, for actually stepping up to the plate. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, so we, we find what it means. We are created in the image of God, and sin came along and, dis and distorted this image. This isn't who, who we are. It's just a distortion of who we are, and that's key. King David wrote many of the Psalms, and in Psalm 51, he wrote, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So in other words, we're all born with a distorted reality of our sin, of, of our, this image of God. So we all have this sin nature. But that doesn't mean that we're born gay. That just means that we are born with this propensity to sin. And I be believe that we could have this propensity toward a certain sin. You might be born with a propensity toward alcoholism or toward gossiping or toward whatever, but a propensity is different from a predetermination. So as a matter of fact, I just mentioned alcoholism. I think alcoholism, there are some even genetic factors that have been proven that could influence that. When Adam and Eve sinned, that affected not just us spiritually, but I, that affected us biologically and genetically as well. So genetic factors plays a role in the development of alcoholism. And I think genetics could even maybe have been shown to an, have shown to other sins as well. Not, shown, not be surprising. Study even, well, even shown that adultery or might even have a link. I'm not surprised with that. The fall, fall of Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve in fact, creation. The fall of creation. However, however, that does, does make us, us not guilty. We look at, you know, biology doesn't make something morally permissible. Mass murderers, you know, their brains are different from ours. And that's a good thing. But it doesn't mean then that they are innocent. Like they can't help what they're doing. No, we're still responsible for our actions. We... I even know people will say, well, you know, it's natural. We find homosexuality occurring in nature. You guys heard that before? You know, sheeps do it, black swans do it, whatever, you know, all, you know. Okay, sure, they do. But let me give you a little bit of advice. Don't take your moral cues from animals. Right? I mean, they, they eat each other. <laughs> Right? I mean, they, some of animals, they eat their children. Don't eat your children, please. I mean, really, just don't do what animals do. That's just a good lesson for humans. You know, if we're going to take our moral, sexual moral cues from animals, I mean, they do a lot of things. I mean, animals rape each other. I mean, it's just, you know, let's just use common logic. There are things that animals do that humans just don't do. Um. So overall, when we look at the science, when we look at theology and the Bible, it says that actually it's complex and there are probably genetic factors, biological, all play in, but all of it has one base, and that's sin. And, and so it's, it's complex, it's both biological, it's environmental, it's nature and nurture. The question isn't nature or nurture, it's nature and nurture. And then we have all these quotes from these secular professional organizations. So for example, the American Psychiatric Association, they said this, some people believe that sexual orientation is innate and fixed. However, sexual orientation develops across a person's lifetime. Another quote from the American uh, Psychological Association, or the, uh, they said, there's no consensus 
what are the exact reasons that a person develops a sexual orientation. Much research has examined all these different causes. No findings have emerged that permit scientists to conclude that sexual orientation is determined by any particular factor or factor. Many think that nature and nurture both play complex roles. For the American Academy of Pediatrics, I mean, I'm listing all these major scientific professional organizations, and all of them are saying this. Sexual orientation is not determined by any one factor, but by a combination of factors. And then I'd like this next quote. is from the Association for Gay and Lesbian Psychiatrists. No one knows what causes sexuality. There's a renewed interest in searching for a biological cause for homosexuality. However, to date, there are no replicated studies supporting any specific biological cause for homosexuality. And then two more quotes from uh, researchers in the Midwest. It's more likely that there are several genes that influence non-genetic factors, including psychological and social influences to determine sexual orientation. And then the next quote uh, says, as much as people like to divide themselves, what genes actually do in the brain reflects the interaction between hereditary and environmental influences. So we see that it is complex, and the professional, secular, scientific organizations say that it's both. And we look at God's Word, and we see that actually we're not surprised that it is many, many things. But when we do this theological reflection, you know what? We come to the real conclusion that at the core, it's not really these factors that's causing someone. It's our sin nature at the end of the day. That is what is the main cause for, you know, for, for, for bringing this out. And yet there's all this emphasis that we find, especially among Christians, that we want to pinpoint and find out what's the exact cause. And, you know, when we do that, you know what we're falling into, the mistake? We're falling to this fallacy of thinking that if we can find the cause, we can find the cure. We treat this like a totally different issue. I mean, when was the last time you heard a, a message about the causation of gossiping? You know, I mean, have you ever heard of it? You know, you know, what's the etiology of a pornography addiction? Honestly, maybe we should spend some more time about that. Because when we do, we would treat this like, you know, any other thing. But we don't. We treat this somehow as so different that as we dig deep into their life... If we can find the cause, then we can find the cure. And honestly, that's based more on a Freudian idea of humanity than a biblical view of who we are. We don't believe, as Freud did, that we're a blank slate born, and then as childhood happens, that is what makes us who we are. That's not biblical. The Bible says that we are born, created in the image of God, right? But that image at birth has been distorted by the fall. And that is more representative. That is representative of who we are. So this idea that absentee father, dominant mother, etc., is what causes us actually completely disregards the fact that we are born with a sin nature. And let me tell you why this is so important. Remember I said at the beginning... We need to have the correct diagnosis because if we diagnose this as the problem being the parents or childhood development, then our treatment then ends up in the wrong direction as well. We think that we can come up with some therapy that can repair someone when actually no man-made solution can repair a problem that needs God. If we diagnose this correctly, as the Bible does, and we read from the beginning to the end, and the Bible is so clear that this is sinful behavior, and if we know it's sinful behavior, you know what's the diagnosis? A sin nature. And if we diagnose this correctly as a sin nature and as a spiritual problem, guess what the answer must be? It must be a spiritual answer. And if we know that sin is the true diagnosis, let me tell you the one only true treatment. Jesus. It always comes back to that. I mean, I hope that, I hope you're not tired of me saying this. I mean, all my talks, it comes back to that. Yes, I'm talking about sexuality, but you know what? I'm coming back to Jesus. 
Yes, you love your gay friend or your gay son or daughter, but you know what the issue is? Really, not their sexuality. It's Jesus. It's the Lord Christ. Our response, our solution, our treatment for a spiritual problem has to be a spiritual answer. It has to be Christ-centered. It has to be focused upon mentoring, discipleship, and the body of Christ. Oftentimes, we want to push people out of the church and get help, you know, help, have them get help outside the church when really this is the context, you and me, believers in Christ, who are able best to point people to the true answer for sin, Christ. And I know many of you guys have good friends who strongly believe that science has proven that they're gay or that they even believe themselves they are, that they're gay or even maybe they're not gay, but they say that people are born gay. And uh, you could go through some of this information and show that actually science is not even close to that, proving any of that. You could do that. But I think something else that you could say is this. You could say, I know you think that you're born gay, but let me tell you something that the Bible says that's even more important. That you may think you're born gay, but the Bible says you must be born again. The old is gone. The new has come. You are a new creation. That's the gospel encapsulated easily for people to understand. You may think you're born an alcoholic. You must be born again. You may think you're born a liar, a cheater, a gossiper. You must be born again. You may think you're a porn addict. You, you insert whatever it is. You must be born again. That is not a message just for the gay community. That a message, that this is a message for all of humanity. You must be born again. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this incredible, supernatural, out-of-this-world message that none of us could come up with. The answer for sin is not something bound up in what we can do. The answer is bound up in your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to not just understand that incredible truth for our own victory over sin, but help us to communicate that and, more importantly, live that out to others so that they can see that we are living a born-again life. We love you and we ask this in the powerful name of Christ and the people of God said, amen. 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 Sorry. Knocking <laughs> you right into a chair here. Hey, would you guys just thank Christopher for taking us through that little journey? Well, due to uh, the time, we'll try to do this pretty quickly, but uh, the staff earlier this week, we sat down, we wanted to write up actually a handful of questions that we thought would be uh, kind of common questions that we believe a lot of us might have um, and uh, that we could ask you to just weigh right. in on. Is that sound, does that sound good? Yeah. And we've kind of broken up, up into some categories. So the first sure. uh, categories, I'm going to hop through a couple of these here, is really about building relationships with yep. those in the mm -hmm. LGBT community. Um, uh, how, how do you engage with those in, in uh, the LGBT community in a loving way? Um, obviously, you talked about the do's and the don'ts about the relationship and how to do that. But um, ultimately, want, we want people to come to Jesus. I mean, yeah. that's what it keeps coming back to. Yep. Uh, but along the way, a lot of times they're going to ask, okay, so, but what does the Bible say? And uh, you talked about how you diffuse those things or how you redirect those, those pieces. Yep. But at what point do you address those, that conversation at all? Or do you just continually redirect, 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 well, redirect? Yeah, they, I, I say um, the people want to pigeonhole us. And, and I, I just feel like it's not, if we tell someone a truth before they're able to really understand it, I think it can be too early. So I, I think that like one of the ways is, I mean, there's other options. I mean, I think a good, another good way to re redirect it is when people, I mean, they're, generally speaking, people who aren't Christian or who identify as gay, they're almost always going to want to come back to this one point. And, and one thing that I would say is, you know, why would it matter what is God's morals if you don't even believe in God? I mean, I, I really want to do my best to point it back to God because, and I would even tell them, you know, 
the morality issue is actually not the most important issue. And you could just say it just like that. And that's true. I mean, look at Jesus Christ. The morality, the law, was not the most important thing. That doesn't mean he just, he didn't think it was, was important. But the most important thing was believing in him as the Messiah. And so I think this, this bug, just lo- he's been here yeah. <laughs> all day. All day. All day. <laughs> he loves me, yeah. So, um, but I think that I do believe, but at what point do you share? I think it's once they actually, you know, have this belief in God, you know, yeah. because it's once you, if it's always first talking about, you know, the, the, you know, the reality of God, who is the son, Jesus Christ, basically the gospel. And then it's once they understand that and believe in that, well, then that's when we get to the moral issues. Yeah. You know, we, we, we don't, I think a good lesson for you as you're, navigating all these issues, is whatever question you have about homosexuality, replace that with another sin issue. Let's just, let's just keep it like a sexual sin. Uh, let's say um, sex before marriage. You know, uh, that's pretty common in, in the non-Christian world. And so, you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, your friend who's living with his girlfriend, and, and they're, they're obviously most likely having sex, or whatever that's, you know, we wouldn't look for every opportunity to point out their sin, we would look for every opportunity to share Christ with them. So I think it's the yeah. same way that we want to make sure that we for, you know, push to the forefront who is Christ, who is God, before we talk about the morality. And, and, and be okay with that. And they'll get frustrated with that, but then just say, that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is if there's a God or not. Because again, yes, he has all these ways of living. But I mean, you know, there's, there are other things that you might think that are pretty radical, like, you know, we believe that believe, you know, following idols is not good, and, and they, you know, uh, probably they would think, you know, Hinduism is not, not a bad thing. Buddhism is, you know, where God has a pretty strong stance on that. So why even talk about the morality issues yeah. when yeah. you don't even believe in that? Yeah. How can you, um, I, I didn't have this one written down, but, um, you know, you think about when you were living in the gay lifestyle and your parents were trying to plant these seeds of the gospel in, yes. in you. At that point, you were throwing the Bibles in the trash. You yep. were, you had one nothing. I love your mom. Love <laughs> during yeah. lunch today, we were, she was sharing about how she dragged you guys to, to a conference. And, yes. And you were just so angry. I was um, so upset. Yeah. But uh, that, that whole, um, the whole deal of, is there a secret sauce, if you will, yeah. to that, to breaking the barrier to someone, to maybe someone who's living in the gay lifestyle who has be- become so anti-God. Yep. Uh, you know, I wanted to, um, all my friends were telling me Christians are like this. So I was trying to take my parents and put them in this box. Uh, so I would um, agitate them. And, you know, purposefully. Yeah. I mean, how many of you guys have, you know, no prodigals in your life, right? <laughs> Aren't they the best at pushing buttons and making you, you do? <laughs> no. Uh, and, uh, you know, just, you know, your, your younger sibling is your prodigal. But, you know, we, we, we want, prodigals are so good at, like, pushing buttons and, and forcing. I was, I mean, I was bad at everything else, but I was so good at agitating my parents, and the reason why I was doing that, because I wanted them to respond in a bad way. So what then happened if they responded? Well, they're in this box. You see what I mean? There's what, these crazy right-wing fanatics. And they never took my bait. They never responded. So I could never, foot, you know, even though I kept trying to push them there, they never took that bait. So don't take the bait of your prodigals. And that takes supernatural patience, <laughs> you know, but, but so I, I think, um, so can, it's that continuing. Yeah. The unconditional love, continuing yeah. the love, yeah. continuing to be there. Yeah. And yeah. honestly, my parents, nev- they didn't, they never said the words, you're living in sin mm-hmm. or your b- behavior is sinful. They never said that, but I knew, I, I think Christians, we, we think we have to tell them when they already know. Like, they already know. But you know what they don't know? That you still love them. Yeah. yeah. So we Good. think we need to keep reminding them, this is what I believe, and you know this is sin, when it's like, they already know that. You don't have to keep telling it. Like, you know, uh, you know, 
if you have your child that comes to you and, and you know, you know, and I've heard many parents, they're like, I tell them, I love you. I love you no matter what. And that's the right thing to say. Unfortunately, you know what they followed up with? But. And you know what that but does? Erases everything that you just said. In their mind. Not, I mean, that even though that's not true, but remember, what people perceive is sometimes more important than what is reality. Yeah. So even that was leading into my next question, talking to parents, perhaps. We have a lot of parents in this church uh, that have kids who have come on out of the closet. Mm-hmm. And it, it, how, how do they respond? What's, what is the response that doesn't have the but at the end of it? You know, what's, the, what's that statement that parents just so yeah. desperately, if you were sitting there going, man, this is what I needed to hear from my parents. Um, yeah. What is that? So, um, because when I came out to them, it was before they were a Christian. Yeah. So we didn't have the thing where, hey, mom, I'm gay, and they're Christian, and then they had a chance to respond. But uh, you know, I, I tell the story because the narrative that we hear in the world is that Christian parents hate their gay children, and they reject them, whatever. Uh, Non-Christian parents love their gay children. I have the exact opposite. My non-Christian parents rejected me, told me you got to choose this, you know, but then they came to Christ, and what happened? They loved me. So it was the exact opposite of what the world says. But I would say if you have a prodigal son or daughter, you know, or, or they're gay or whatever it is, just simply tell them, I love you. Just drop the butt because they know what that butt part. part. Um, you know, they know you well. They, they know that you haven't changed. You're not pr- going to change. Um, and just... Because in, in, their, in their mind, they keep convincing themselves that, no, my parents don't love me. My parents don't love me. They can't, you know, they, they don't love that part of me, whatever it is. And we just need to, that's the part that we need to help convince them and remind them that we do love them. The part about what we believe, they already know that. There's, there, there's no need to kind of keep refer, reaffirming that. Tell me this, would you have received this from your parents? Because we talk a lot here about the church, or here at, at Lakeland, about the power of declaration of truth, of mm, God's amen. word um, over people. Would you have received it if your parents would have declared over you, you are loved, you are these things? Totally, yeah. yeah. And I mean, that's why I think it's so important. I mean, even now, uh, we pray as a family every day. Um, and I, I, I look through the Bible, and one of the most biblical things that a father can do is to bless his children. We don't do that. I I know very, very, very few people who actually do that. Why not? That is one of the most biblical things I know. You can even go, you know, charismatic and lay your hands on your kids. You know, I mean, that's, (laughs) it shouldn't be considered charismatic. That's biblical, you know. Lay your hands on your kids, on their shoulder if they don't like their hair messed up, whatever, and just, (laughs) you know, bless them. And and just, and it makes them feel uncomfortable, fine, do it shorter, whatever, but just bless them. You know, do it over the phone, and I just, I just want to bless you, you know, and, and whatever. And, you know, or just if they don't like that part, then just say, I'm praying for you. You know, let me know. And, you know, <laughs> oftentimes I, I have parents that are like, I tell them that, then I'm praying for them, and, you, and the kids are like, don't pray for me. Right? You know, they're like, because I know what you're praying for. And you, and you know, <laughs> right? So, you know what I tell parents to say? I tell them, you know, tell parents to tell their kids, I pray for everyone that I love. How can they argue with that, Right? <laughs> You know, and just say, I'm going to pray for you whether you like it or not because I love you. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Yeah, but yes, declare truth over them. Yeah. Sure. Talk to our parents a little bit. Uh, this was one of these questions that we are all talking about is at what age do we start, you know, in, in a, once again, you were saying it's not too early. Never. It's never yeah. too early to, to start. Uh, but how do we help our kids? Once again, they're seeing if, if they're in the public school system or even just uh, around in, in the public area, yeah. they see, you know, uh, ladies holding hands, guys holding hands. You, they see these yeah. relationships openly. Television. Yep. yep. So how do you help your kids raise them to love everyone yeah. um, and yet guard their hearts Definitely. Um, to what a biblical picture of marriage and relationships and sexuality looks like? Yeah, so I tell parents, uh, Christian parents, that before they talk about sexuality, uh, and, and I'm saying sexuality generally, so not just homosexuality, but sexuality in general, uh, I think there's probably two important concepts that kids need to understand. First of all, 
we need to help our kids understand sin. And not just this really simplistic view of sin, bad things, but that uh, sin is not only behavior, but also this nature that we have. You know, that we're every person born has this propensity, this sin nature that we call. Um, and talk about temptation. And differentiating the, the difference between sin, sinful behavior, and temptation. They're, they're different because sometimes... We, we can go through life and kids grow up all, you know, they can't differentiate the two. Oh, I'm tempted, so I must be sinning. No, you're tempted. That in and of itself is not sin. But when you give in to that lust or whatever, that turns into, into or when you act on it, that is sin. So helping kids to clearly differentiate the two. It's normal to be tempted. You will be tempted. And I want to equip you as a child even that when you have these temptations, you know, that's when God gives us the ability by the Holy Spirit to say no to those temptations and not give in to sin. So I think it's clear to understand that. So the concept of sin, temptation, sin nature, but then grace. So these two concepts, sin and grace. And when they have that concept, and these are, you know, abstract ideas that, you know, kids sometimes at five or six, aren't able to fully grasp, but I think we need to talk through those and continue talking that as they grow up. But once they have, I think if they have kind of that foundation, it's so easy then to lay on that, the concept of sexuality, especially when it comes to homosexuality. You know, we have, you know, our gay neighbor, and they're just like us. They have a sin nature, uh, and they're tempted, but the difference is they don't have the Holy Spirit that enables them to say this is wrong, and so they're acting on it, and they're making it who they are, but guess what we have to do? That second part, grace. Just as God ex extends grace to us, we must extend grace to others. So it differentiates as well sinners and how we extend grace and love. That's good. That's good. Oh, my phone turned off. Let's just imagine that there's another brilliant question I've got. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> oh, Siri. I know. Siri, Siri, Siri you... popped up on me. <laughs> oh, brother. Siri. All right. Hold on. All right. How do you, um, oh, here, let's, sh let's shift on over to, are you ready for a little political question? Yeah, okay, all sure. Right. But, all right, so what's, what would you suggest would be a Christian's response in regards to LGBT uh, matters in, in terms of um, some of the laws that are being passed? Even right now, it's in the Supreme Court, and they're yeah. discussing right now what right. Uh, should be taking place with the, the one, the kind of the cake, yeah, the cake, the cake incident issue, issue yeah. if you will. Uh, and, and there's a lot of Christians who, who have said, um, are falling kind of, they feel torn because right. they're like, all right, uh, biblically, I might disagree with uh, the behavior, yes. but I believe in e equality. Yep. And so do I vote for equality and treating people equally, or do I vote for a biblical standard? Mm -hmm. Do you have a, an opinion yeah, on that? Yeah, so um, I, I believe that, um, I believe when it comes to state-given rights, um, People should be treated, you know, when it comes to hiring, when it comes to, um, you know, people being discri discriminated against for housing or uh, mistreated, you know, no one should be mistreated because they're different or a certain way for whatever reason. So, so from that perspective, um, I think that as just a human being, we should have no, di you know, no difference. But, you know, we also, you know, well, then does that apply to then Christian organizations? I believe uh, we need to be, as Christian organizations, um, there is discrimination that happens when it comes to Christian organizations because we're not going to put as a pastor someone who's Muslim. I mean, that's discriminating against Muslims then, you know what I mean? Um, I'm not going to hire someone who's an, who's an atheist. People could say that's discrimination. Well, that's just common discrimination. I mean, that's, you know, so there's, but... What, what I'm saying is you're not going to be judged for something that everyone else isn't judged for. You know, so same thing with if you're going to work for, I mean, let's just say for, uh, you know, Planned Parenthood or something like that. I mean, secular organization, they're not going to hire someone who's pro-life. Well, then we can say, well, that's discrimination. You know what I mean? I mean, so as long as you're consistent, I mean, whatever the values of this organization, where obviously that's, it's not considered discrimination to then hire them. But, but generally speaking, if you're hired for, you know, uh, serving at McDonald's, that has nothing to do with uh, your religion or uh, your sex, being male or female, or even you know where you stand when it comes to sexual orientation and stuff like that. So that I believe that that should be protected. I don't have any problems with that 
Um, I, I think we need to realize that um, when it comes to uh, marriage, because I had a lot of, you know, I speak at college campuses and stuff, and a lot of times it's this, uh, the, the, what I hear from students, college students, is um, I believe this is sin, but I also believe that people should have that right to marry if they want. So I'm, I believe this is sin, but I'm actually for equality, and I'm advocating for same-sex marriage. The problem is, I mean, we think that either we're against it and we're fighting against it in the law, or we're for it. I don't think those are the only two options. And I think that there can be a middle ground where I could say, I'm for it. I mean, I'm not, I'm not for it, but I'm not going to be, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not like fighting against it, but I'm not going to be completely advocating for, for it either. And I'll tell you the, the reason why this is. It's because I don't, if we're actually for something and actually encouraging it, and it's actually something that uh, is not only sin, but it could be a stumbling block to get in the way of someone to know Christ. Mm. Remember, we always need to hold highest people coming to know Christ. And I can say in my situation, just personally from an anecdotal perspective, uh, if same-sex marriage was legal 20 years ago, I probably would have gotten married. I mean, maybe that would have lasted maybe less than a year, but still, I, you know, I would have pursued that. I can't imagine if I were to get married, and maybe that did last longer, and someone tried to share with me the gospel, my marriage would be a huge stumbling block for me to come to know Christ. And we just have to remember, you know, we could be throwing these stumbling blocks in the way. So I think it's okay to say I'm not going to be completely adamant and fighting against it, which some Christians, I mean, either you, you can be. I'm not saying that that's wrong. I mean, we need to pray for where God has for me, you know, what to do. But some young Christians will say, I'm not going to obviously fight adamantly against it, but that doesn't mean that you actually have to be ad advocating for it. I kind of stood in the middle where it's like, I'm, I'm not necessarily going to be vocal and fighting against it because I, I kind of felt like it was a ready done deal because I f felt like that could influence, especially if I'm public, influence my voice in, uh, you know, among the gay community. But I'm not going to be strongly advocating something that could be a stumbling block to for the gospel. Yeah, that makes sense, that whole stumbling block piece. I like that. All right, let me ask you another uh, question. Uh, this, these all kind of go into the what's on the horizon. Yeah. Um, could you speak to the topic of transgender? Uh, what are the important things for the church to focus on as we minister uh, to those in that realm? I mean, we've, I, I feel like we're, we're running into people all the right. time who are saying we're, that's the common. We're there now, mm -hmm. and um, it's, uh, my ministry focuses primarily on sexual identity, and m my talks don't, but some of the Principles when it comes to evangelism, I, I think, apply to transgenderism. So the, the difference between the two is when it comes to sexual identity, this is related to, uh, in, th this is more interpersonal issues. In other words, homosexuality, heterosexuality, you know, these terms apply to an individual and their sexual attractions or romantic desires for another person. Are they for the same sex or the opposite sex? Gender identity is not interpersonal, it is intrapersonal. I mean, it's, it's related to myself. In other words, what I think about myself. Mm -hmm. And what used to be the same, sex and gender, has now been split. Where sex is male and female from the physical perspective, biological perspective, genetic perspective, but gender is not the physical or uh, you know, so, uh, mental, but it's more psychological. In other words, what I f think of myself or how I view myself. Oh, I myself yeah. So most people, these two match where I'm born male, my sexual organs are male, my genetics are male, uh, or I have male genetics, uh, and then how I perceive myself. I I view myself, I understand myself, I feel like I'm a male. So those match. In the realm of gender identity studies, they call that cisgender, C-I-S gender, where they mass, match. People who, where that, there's a discordance, where those two don't match, where people are born, their biological sex is, is male, but then they view themselves as female. We will call that transgender, where they're not the same. So that's the reality of transgenderism. And though that seems, I mean, like, on, what's unfortunate is we feel like as Christians we have no 
framework to think about this because there's no biblical text that actually talks about transgenderism. We have biblical text that talks about cross-dressing. Men don't wear women's clothing, etc. cetera. Uh, you know, so I don't know if that's a message for peop- men who wear skinny jeans, but, you know, maybe we take that to, <laughs> to light. Uh, but, <laughs> but, you know, that's, those issues are not talking about transgenderism. Yes, cross-gender dressing and transgenderism has some overlap, but it's not exactly the same phenomenon. So there's actually no specific text that talks about transgenderism, where you, my gender is discordant or you know, they don't match with my biological sex. So then people then jump to this conclusion and say, the Bible says nothing about transgenderism. False. Because though there might not be a specific text biblically, that doesn't mean that the whole of Scripture has nothing to say theologically. And this is the difference. You know, when I went to Moody, I was like, why is there the Bible department and theology department? Aren't they the same? Not really. Bi- Bible department is we're studying books. We're, you know, looking at what these verses say and what Paul says in all his letters and stuff. You know, that's kind of the Bible department. Where theology is not saying I'm looking at this or I'm looking at. They're saying I'm looking at all of this. So instead, like, one is looking at the trees. The other one is looking at the forest. So does the whole Bible theologically say something that informs us when it comes to transgenderism? Yes. And what is it? First, when I see transgenderism, the issue isn't what we feel and, you know, the difference between sex and, and gender. The issue is what or who determines truth. This is a truth issue. Is truth determined by me? or by you, or by you. Hmm. No. Truth is not determined by me, or what I feel, or even what I think. Truth is an objective reality, not a subjective reality. That's what the Bible says, right? Plain and simple. What does the world say? Truth is not an objective reality. It's a subjective reality. So it's totally opposite. So when we get that, that helps us to understand and be able to discern and be able to, you know, respond well theologically to transgenderism. Transgenderism is is making a subjective determination for what is reality. I mean, and, and actually, to put it more kind of from a secular level, for those of your friends who totally embrace transgenderism, one question that you can just ask them is this. Explain to me, you know, you can kind of preface it and say, I know you just believe facts and science, right? That's what all secular, they, they say that when they don't really, because they say, prove to me, you know, creation. They, they can't do that by science. Uh, so just say, I know you believe only in facts and science, but explain to me through just facts and science why, when it comes to transgenderism, why biology is trumped by psychology. That's what transgenderism is. Hmm. Biology proves for a fact that a person is male or female. And, and again, uh, I'm not talking about intersex. People like to p- conflate the two. Intersex is what was used to be known as hermaphrodism, and, you know, what, where people are born with vague genitalia. That is a different phenomenon because that's biological and physical and genetic and all that where transgenderism is purely, you don't find people who are intersex and say that I'm transgender, they, they just, they're intersex. Where people are, are it is 100% known what is their biological sex, but it's just their gender, what they feel about themselves that doesn't match. And so the world is saying, what we feel trumps everything else. And I want to say, why? H- how come? I mean, and that's just a, a pretty reasonable question to ask our unbelieving friends. Why do we elevate psychology over biology? I mean, if we're truly being, you know, uh, scientific, the two should be equal, right? I mean, they're they're both sciences, and so we should see them. But now we are elevating one and say, this trumps biology. And so it's not only from the secular, you know, but from the perspective, but from the theological perspective where, where we say, no, we know that there is an objective reality that isn't, that, that actually trumps our subjective reality. Yeah, that's good. All right. I'm watching the time here. <laughs> um, I want to ask you two more questions. Okay? Sure. One is, uh, what do you see on the horizon? What, what, what's the, 
the, the hurdles. Next thing. Yeah, the next thing. The, the next hurdles. mountain. Yeah, the next mountain. Yeah, is, I, I think you know, obviously transgenderism, which we talk, I mean, and that's that's just that's here. Uh, and obviously, I won't even say this is here. This has been there. I mean, we're we're past because we're just seeing. You know how a tree grows. You know, it's the root system. The root system has been here for decades. You know, it, it all stems from post postmodernity which this is what post-modernity modernity is. There's no objective reality. It's all subjective reality. I determine truth. So transgenderism is really just the fruit of post-modernity, which has been around for decades. I know when I went to grade school, I, bas- I looked back and I realized I was te- taught post-modernism in the 70s. It just was assumed to be true. You know? And so yep. I think that that's that. But also what I see in, in Christianity is, you know, we're already expecting and, and seeing where evangelical churches are now embracing same-sex marriages. This is God blessed. Yeah. I don't see this as the next big issue. What I see as the next big issue are now churches who say, this understanding or this position on whether this is sin or not, same-sex relationships, this is something that we just need to agree to disagree on. To me, I see that as the next big issue that I think in the next five years, we're going to see a plethora of evangelical churches that are going to say, we just have to be united on this and agree to disagree, just like we would agree to disagree on baptism or agree to disagree on, you know, whatever, spiritual gifts, et cetera, whatever it might be. What they've done is they've, they've kind of lowered this or determined it to be a non-essential issue. And the confusion, and, and what people say is, this is not a gospel issue. You know, this is not what's going to keep you in heaven or not. What we do, the mi- big mistake is, we confuse that everything has to be, everything of importance has to be just be a gospel issue. Not true. When I look at the writings of Paul, he was so clear when it comes to sexual immorality. Just read 1 Corinthians. What did he say about the sexual immoral man? Cast him out. There's no let's agree to disagree to keep him in. You know? I mean, throughout even even 1 Peter, I mean, it's it's all through the whole New Testament. When it comes to sexual immorality, there was no wiggle room. This is clearly sin, and if someone continues in unrepentant sin, it's not like, you know what, okay, let's just agree to disagree and just be one, and let's not argue. It's, I mean, it's some harsh words that just cast him out. Um, and so I think we need to take those words. So I don't want to use the words that's essential because that's kind of already in theology. We were to have an idea. I want to say this is of something of major significance. It is a significant issue, sexual morality is. Yeah. And um, so I, I think that's what's kind of on the next horizon, uh, coming up. Yeah. All right, last question. Uh, for those who are wanting additional resources or they're wondering what now, is there something besides your book? You know, <laughs> wh- where else can they go to find yeah. support? Maybe it's a parent forum even for parents who are dealing with this, uh, these questions or teens or wh- where, where are you suggesting hey, here's a great place to get additional resources. Um, I'm actually working on my second book, which is the Christian Response book, which is talking about a theology of sexuality. That, you know, we that, know that how could long be that's one. taking I know you that's, to that's going to take you forever to write. Yeah. Yeah. So like next that. decade, that'll be out. <laughs> but um, you know, I, I would say that there's some helpful resources um, when it comes. But to me, some, some voices that are really helpful for me, uh, Rosaria Butterfield, if you guys are interested, she's coming from a, a lesbian perspective, and um, she is, although is an English professor, is one of the most theologically uh, grounded people that I know as a Christian who's never been to seminary. Um, she's got three books that are, uh, two books, one that is coming out next on hospitality that I think are really helpful uh, in helping frame it. Like, I think we always, we, we want to jump into doing right before we think right. And when we jump to do right and we think we're doing right, we actually, without thinking right, we actually might be doing wrong. So I think it's really helpful. She does it really well of how to frame things right and uh, just give you some practical things about Her first book is her memoir uh, called Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert. Her second book is Openness and Unhindered, which talks specifically about sexual identity. 
and kind of the history behind that, uh, the semantics around that, the morphology around uh, orientation and stuff, which is, I think is really helpful. Third book is now Practical Things on, on Hospitality. Like that, was, that is what won her to Christ, and hospitality is definitely a theological concept that we, we don't really practice or understand very well. Uh, Sam Albury is another uh, good thinker. He comes from the UK, is from um, the Anglican Church, and uh, I think he communicates really well in a winsome way, but also from a, a good theological uh, base. Um, so I think those are some helpful foundations. If you want to learn more about singleness, uh, he doesn't come with any background when it comes to homosexuality, but the, the, the best, most profound thinker when it comes to biblical theology of sexual, singleness is a guy named Barry Danilak. He has uh, two main books. One is called Redeeming Singleness, and that's a book that you can get here in the U.S. The second one that I would strongly recommend for those of you that, that's, a, that's a, uh, more of a theological book, and it, it can be, uh, you know, you need to really dig deep hard, uh, but a, a one that's really helpful, that's easy to read, only about, it's about 40, 50 page pamphlet is something called a biblical theology of singleness. It sounds scary, but it's actually really <laughs> practical and easy to read. That's short. You can't buy it here in the U.S. You have to get online, and, you, and it's, it's a little pamphlet that's only purchased in the U.K. But it's, yeah, I think it's like two or three pounds to purchase and then two or three pounds uh, to have them ship it. And since the pound is decreasing, that might be good. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that's phenomenal when it comes to uh when it comes to better understanding of singleness that's awesome um i guess i i do want to close with this uh reality is that we know here at lakeland we actually have um dozens and dozens of people who uh have openly said hey this is this is my journey that i've been walking in is same-sex attractions and so if you have family members if that's something that you found yourself in that journey um, don't feel like you're alone. I mean, it's that, 